my check. Wunderbar. Like I was stating, uh, no after action on today's unit two quiz two, uh, because uh, you could see where, uh, for those of you who did well, you could see where I derived the questions from. I took the slide, I found what was important in the slide, made a practice question. And I'm going to do that today for um, uh, your, um, what's it called, the Universal Precautions uh, lecture today, because <clears throat> if you noticed, whoever made the, um, uh, the review for this week had like 20 questions on the lecture on Tuesday, but three questions on the, uh, on the lecture for today. And the lecture for today has, what, 35 slides. So sums up, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, whoever the author was uh, didn't find universal precautions important, which, by the way, each and every one of us in here, that is also one of the reasons why people look up to our profession because we are in danger every day. We are exposed to horrific things every day. So we have to protect ourselves. So this lecture is uh, uh, pretty important, pretty neat because it explains a way all the little stupid little rules which seem silly, like, um, like for example, hand washing. Uh, when I used to teach medical assistant clinicals, they hate it. They're like, why are we doing hand washing? I worked as a CNA. I worked as this. We already did it already. Now, not to the level of what a clinical scrub is and definitely uh, the surgical techs. When the nurse isn't there, guess who's the one who's uh, actually standing next to the surgeons when we scrub in? You are because you have to watch the protocols on how I scrub in. And a lot of the really horrific things that happen in surgery happen because of uh, something we call poor aseptic technique. If you look at the word asepsis, sepsis, we already know septic, ick pertaining to what? Uh, when we have septicemia, I have garbage or pathogens all over my blood. And wherever my blood is, wherever my blood goes, that's where the pathogen will go. That's why septicemia is very uh, dangerous. And if my patient is septic, that's a problem. And remember what we talked about in the other lecture. No matter how much I put every chemical on my skin, there's always going to be some sort of potential pathogen so that when I plunge that, um, uh, that scalpel to do the surgery, what am I actually doing? I am actually pushing that bad stuff inside towards my blood. And so uh, the surgical tech has to uh, know and understand each and every one of the procedures are done to do what? To minimize, uh, to minimize that harm. So uh, let's jump right in. And today we're doing infection control. So look at uh, our modules and do um, two lectures and additional resources, and we're going to look at the PowerPoint, and then we're going to look at uh, some of these videos. All right. So infection control and standard precautions, like we stated. You can never get rid of infection. You can never get rid of bacteria, viruses, and whatnot. There's always going to be a potential for, uh, for a pathogen. But what we have to do is we have to do things to control it, to maintain it at a minimal, right? And there's also standard precautions, things we do like every day. And uh, another term for standard precautions is universal precautions. Universal, when you look at the word universal, uni means what? The prefix uni for medical terminology. Those of you who aced my course, uni means what? I'm, I'm riding a unicycle. How many wheels do I have? One, right? I ride a bicycle, I have what? Two. I ride a tricycle, you have three. So uni means what? That means there's only a single standard. That means that standard does not deviate. You don't do like one and a half or uh, maybe three quarters. You do that standard and that standard alone, right? So why? Because of microorganisms. Remember we talked about uh, uh, laypersons say good bacteria, bad bacteria. Medical professionals don't say that. There's no such thing. It, 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 it connotes that 
that the disease that you have has some emotion, like uh, they have some morality, like, oh, bad HIV. What virus is a good virus? Or um, so when you look at it, you have to look at microorganisms as they become pathogenic if they're in the wrong place and in the wrong amount. So just like the example we had from last lecture, E. coli, Escherichia coli. As the suffix of Escherichia coli states that that bacteria should be in my colon. So that is the resident flora of in my colon. It's normal flora that's always present. It's supposed to be there. But if I take a broad spectrum antibiotic, what is, what is it going to do to that uh, normal flora or the resident flora? And flora means growth, right? It's going to ruin it. So that's why, uh, remember the last time you took a, a penicillin type drug, right? Or an, a, a, a broad spectrum antibiotic. Didn't you get sick? Didn't you have stomach cramping and the runs, right? Because why? You're killing the, uh, the normal flora. And in medicine, it's called shotgun therapy. You guys know a shotgun, well, a typical shotgun. Um, it sprays uh, little pellets, right? You know, unless you're, you know, got one and a half inch slugs, but it sprays. So let's say, for example, right? I'm sorry, I'm going to use you as bacteria. You're a bacteria, right? You're a pathogenic bacteria. Everyone else behind you is what? Resident flora or the quote unquote good bacteria. In order for me to kill you, I take my shotgun called penicillin, right? Rack it. Sorry to be graphic, right? I will shoot her. I will kill this bacteria. The problem is all the other pellets are going to hit who? All the good things around it, right? So again, when we're giving antibiotics, when we're giving medications, there's a, there's a pro and con to everything. There's a benefit and there's a risk. So the physician and the DNP are always what? In balance, always, you know, uh, is this good enough for you? That's why I get really, really annoyed when my colleagues just give you antibiotics willy nilly. And they give broad spectrum because they don't want to do the medicine. They give the most wide spraying shotgun they can have. How many of you have ever gone to a doctor, they didn't even do a stethoscope on you, and they give you Keflex three times a day for the next five days, I'll see you next Thursday. And then what happens? Yeah, your lower respiratory tract infection gets a little better, but now you have severe stomach cramping, you can't eat, and now every time you even look at food, you have diarrhea, right? And the cramping is bad, isn't it? Because what's happening? You are destroying that resident flora, that normal flora. That's always present. Oh, by the way, if I mess with this normal flora, don't you think you have a potential to get sick? Because no, remember, normal means I need to be in the middle. If I don't have any Escherichia coli in my colon, what's going to happen to my colon? A whole bunch of bad things. And one of the main bad things that, uh, that will happen is you will have a malabsorption problem. The E. coli helps us absorb. E. coli also helps us uh, make vitamins. So when I destroy that, right, that becomes a problem. There's also transient flora. There are some things, especially in the mouth, right, they grow, especially your anaerobic bacteria. But what does the dentist always tell you? After you eat, you should always brush your teeth. So brush your teeth, because why? You get rid of some of this transient flora and you're bringing down a potential pathogenic bacteria. Remember we talked about plaque? Black has bacteria in it that is very, very conducive to heart disease. So that's why also the, doc, uh, the dentist always says you got to floss. So every little thing that you think as a layperson or a previous layperson is a stupid rule or a hack it, skip it, right? It isn't a stupid rule. It's an, quite an important rule. Now, when you see this slide as well, let's put on our test taking hat. Let's put on our academic hat. You see that there are two categories that look like each other, don't they? Don't you think I'm going to ask a question about it so that you can differentiate the two? So I could ask you, Escherichia coli, which is normally present in my colon or my large intestine, is that resident flora, transient flora, or pathogenic flora? It's, of course, what? Resident, right? Transient. 
What was the example I talked about? There are some, uh, God bless, there are some bacteria in your mouth that are there for a little while. But then you do what? It goes away, right? And if you're immuno, if you're immunocompetent, if you have a good immune system, it should go away and go back to normal lo levels. So that's transient flora. But if my E. coli, if my plaque is in the wrong place, in the wrong amount, then it becomes what? Pathogenic. Then it does what? Then it causes disease. And that's what we're trying to prevent. And, it does, and you'll notice that, I'll be honest with you, uh, and my wife, if she was here, she'll back it up. I'm a very sloppy, sloppy man. She calls me a snake because when I go home, ladies, you know, you know this, maybe your man's one of these people. One foot goes here, the other shoe here. I leave a trail of stuff, which I do not touch because I need to sleep or I need to, um, I don't know, whatever, goof off, right? Because I'm one of those people, I need to goof off at least for an hour when I get home. I don't care if the kids light the house on fire. <laughs> He goes, I'm a very messy person. But if you see me professionally, do you see? My wife comes to see me at work and says, why are you not like this when you're home? Because this is my professional life, right? She goes, look at you. Look, you, you, you're actually dusted and, and, and your bag is in the right place. Oh, is this my house? Half the contents are screwed out. If I'm looking for something, I'm like, no, no, right? I am just your typical dude, right? But in my professional life, why do I have to be so neat? Because of this asepsis thing, right? Because every day we're being exposed. Oh, when I'm at home, uh, the, you know, of course, the five-year-old always blows snot chunks all over your shirt. I will wear that sweater the whole weekend, and it will stink. And I'm walking around, I'm walking around Sunday night, and my wife goes, that is gross. And I go, oh, I go, oh it's okay, you know. Right? But if I did that in the hospital, my goodness, it's not only disgusting, right? It's what that was also the other thing that I asked when I was a resident. When I was a resident, I looked at all the other residents. Why does everyone get that like pediatrics gets to wear their little teddy grams, you know, uh, their little cute little scrub. They get to wear all these little cute friendly scrubs. Surgery get to wear their scrubs all day, every day. Why does I am have to dress like this with the coat all day, every day? And we're here the longest. Because why? Remember, even though I'm messy in real life, because even though I'm a borderline ne'er-do-well in real life, in my professional life, I have to be different. And that brings up the other thing. Now that I got the majority of you in here, some of you, I'm preaching to the pulpit because you were in here on time. Because uh, especially in the Filipino culture, there's something called Filipino time. The Filipinos are living in the past. Uh, you tell them to get get be somewhere at eight. They'll they'll waltz in what eight twenty, and the physicians and nurses they do the same thing. But here's the funny part: uh, if you ever heard the statistic, it's true. I looked it up. The Philippines supplies a third of the nurses in the world, in the world. And let me tell you right now, you know, um, uh, thirty years working in the business, I have never seen a nurse late. If they were late, like one minute, it's a something. Right, they actually have to be there early because of something called endorsement rounds. Right, so whatever you are, your, your personal life, you could change the mask, you could change, change the helmet, and be what, whatever you are in your professional life. Okay, he goes because why? Because the person that we're looking for in this job is type A. They're very very neat. They're very meticulous. For example, when's the last time I've done surgery? When's the last time I've done a lab that uh, that required me to glove up? But look at my fingernails. They're down to the nubs, aren't they? Why? Because it's habit, right? Oh, if you leave me in my house and I don't have to be at work. Oh, I love growing those. I love growing my nails out like a Fu Manchu nails. I like <laughs> I like mess. And then I also play piano. So I like the click, click, clacky, clacky sound it makes. My wife goes, that is so gross. During the Christmas break, goes, uh, I grew up my pinky, and my kids goes, what is with the cocaine pinky? And I go, no, it's cool. And I go, I can eat Cheeto dust when I, I was like, this. and they're like, ew, because that's dirty, it's disgusting. But could I ever do that here or at work? No, I can't, because it will endanger somebody, because this is what we're talking about, pathogenicity and virulence. And again, you have something on the same slide that's going to compare. So this is automatically telling you what? 
this is a question. I have to tell the difference between pathogene pathogenicity and virulent. So pathogenicity is the ability of a microorganism to produce disease. So for example, right now, I have a lot of Staphylococcus aureus and Staphylococcus epidermidis on my skin. But I'm not going to do it, but I can lick my arm all day. Will I get sick? Odds are no. But we all know what happens when someone takes E. coli and puts it on my sandwich. Will I get sick? Oh, you betcha. You'll know it, what, in the next 12 hours. Anyone here ever had food poisoning? It is a beaut, isn't it? It attacks you really quickly. So the pathogenicity of E. coli is far greater than what? than just Staphylococcus epidermis regarding what? The oral root. Because you've seen kids, you've seen your kid, they're just like, they're like cats. They're like licking body parts and they're, they're disgusting. Watch the five-year-old just suck on his toes while he's watching SpongeBob or whatever. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, it was a lollipop. Did he get sick? No, but that E. coli gets there. Now, the pathogenicity of Staphylococcus aureus in blood ramps up because we already know that staph infection inside my blood, that's septicemia, isn't it? Well, one of the septicemia. So pathogenicity means what is the level of ability for a microorganism to produce a disease? Virulence is how often does it? How often can a pathogen cause disease? So um, da, 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 like a frequency. For example, you guys know you eat at shady places, right? Could have E. coli in it, right? But that's your favorite street taco. So there are days that we do what? We roll the dice, don't we? Right? I do that. Oh, this one Peruvian joint by my house? I go in there, it looks like a Department of Health disaster, but they make the best chicharron sandwich, and I, every once in a while, I'm like, okay, I'm up for it. So that's virulence. Not all the time I'm going to get sick, but I can tell you right now, I get hit with HIV, which is a virus, right? Am I going to get hit? Oh, yeah. Because the virulence of uh, the uh, human immunodeficiency virus is very strong. And once it hits you, it will hit you. You'll definitely have it. Another example of variance is, remember we talked about Epstein-Barr virus, right? Everyone gets excited about RSV, which is, uh, well, EBV can also do some really nasty things to your lungs. But remember what I said, if we took blood tests of everybody in the room, about 40% of you will be EBV positive. <clears throat> but how many people are coughing in this room? Just me, right? Which by the way, I'm EBV, RSV, Corona, Tested the last two years, I've, I've had chronic bronchitis. Tested me for everything. I'm going, oh, I got to have something. Even asthma is got ruled out. So what is this? You don't know. But because the virulence, the frequency of which a pathogen causes disease, you have HIV, it will always cause, it goes, will eventually cause AIDS. It goes, if you have RSV, right, goes, it is not as bad as HIV. And EBV, Epstein-Barr virus is even what? Less virulent. So when you think about virulence, how often, if I get hit, will I get the disease? So think frequency for virulence and pathogenicity means just the overall ability for something to even produce, uh, produce a disease. Another example of low pathogenicity is um, uh, fungus. If you are not immunocompromised, right? You know, after a long day, smell your feet, smell your socks. It smells. It smells of fungus. But will you get sick? If you are immunocompetent, right? You won't get sick because, you know, because your feet stink. So that has a low pathogenicity. It has a low virulence, right? So Pathogenic uh, microorganisms are not all created equal. So let's think about that when we go over our universal precautions. We're going over stuff that has what? Has high pathogenicity, high virulence. Therefore, we should be very, very careful of it. 
especially the Bloodborne, and we're going to get to that. So who's our usual suspects? What are some potential pathogens? Bacteria, viruses, fungi, which is plural, fungus is singular, and bacterium is singular, it's bacteria is plural. Remember, when we're talking about pathogenicity, we're also talking about number. So for example, if I had maybe, let's say, let's, let's make a number scale. Um, let's say I had maybe um, a thousand uh, coliforms, right? And a coliform is uh, in laboratory, we call them floating duties, which is what? E. coli, which means what? There's feces in the thing that you're testing. So let's say on a scale, uh, let's say it was like a thousand. It's not going to get anybody sick. But let's say my patient, we tested it and it's what? 10,000. Oh, 10,000 uh, per high power field. Oh, my patient's definitely going to get sick. So we're going to think of what? Bacteria, plural. Viruses, plural. Fungi, plural. Protozoa, plural. Rickettsia, plural. And Helden, cis with an S, we're thinking about number. Okay, so and it's not a small number. It's going to be what a big number, uh, and like for bacteria, maybe you guys have seen it on tests. They say CFUs or colony forming units. We're not talking. What's in a colony? Not one person. A whole bunch of people. So if you have one CFU, that means what? There's like thousands of bacteria already in it. And then when we're counting things like 10, 15,000 CFUs, it's already telling you what. The person's got a lot of uh, disease potential. So let's look at each category of this because does this look right now when you see a list like this, right? You know what's going to come next. Definitions and uh, pros and cons or characteristics of each category. So isn't that what a test is? Don't you think I could have one, two, three, four, five, six, six easy questions that uh, which of the following does blah, blah, blah. Is it bacteria, viruses, fungus, protozoa? So when you're looking at slides, and these slides, you know, they're really cool. Reminds me of that movie Prometheus. Everyone watch that? If you're into aliens and sci-fi. Looks like the dude. He was Jack, though, wasn't he? Was it Natty? He was definitely on something. Right? If you look at that, it's already screaming, but this is a multiple choice examination. So I'm bored, right? Which I typically am during lectures, right? And you can see how my mind wanders. Remember we talked about active listening? Right when I see a list, I'm already starting to do what? What do I need to do to differentiate that list? So I know, and this is what the lecturer did. So let's look at bacteria. It's small, right? It's not as small as a virus, but it's pretty small. One cell microorganism doesn't have a nucleus, so it doesn't even have a brain. Remember the nucleus that had all the DNA? So it's a very simple thing. All it wants to do is live and grow. So it can't be a good thing or a bad thing, right? And they need an environment that will provide food for survival, um, uh, especially the dental people. You're going to learn that there's aerobic environments and anaerobic environments. A lot of the nastiness in your mouth, in between the crevices of your gums or your gingiva and your teeth, they are what? Anaerobic. And it supplies an environment that they love. Think about a lot of the nasty bacteria, right? Uh, or even the fungus. Isn't it a warm place? Your mouth? It's dark. It's got a lot of salt and sugar because did you brush your teeth? No, you didn't. You got a lot of leftover food feeding all of that. Right? And they multiply by simple cell division. Sometimes they release spores and they cause a wide range of illnesses. And why do we have it up front? Because wide range of illnesses and it's very common. Bacteria everywhere. Remember, there's 250 things in this room that can kill you. The majority of them are what? Bacteria. We're all immunocompetent. Therefore, no one, you might get a little sick, but no one's dying today. At least I have not. Next, a virus. Remember we talked about viruses? They are very small, right? Um, on the scale of things, let's say a bacteria, a typically sized bacteria is about the size of a beach ball. A typical sized um, 
a virus compared to a bacteria is about the size of a pea. You know your peas? That small. It is so small it goes through skin, it goes through cell walls, and it goes directly into your nuclear envelope because what do viruses do? They do not get nourishment, right? They get nourishment from who? They're parasites. They live inside cells. And they live to, again, they live just to what? Grow. So remember we, uh, the analogy I made? It was like, it, it, was, it was a cytologic uh, home invasion. So after they use up all the home's resources, what happens to the, the host cell? It dies. And then it releases you know, anywhere from 10,000 to a million of these little viruses everywhere. And then they do what? Go invade somebody else. <clears throat> they have DNA and RNA, but what they really use is the DNA and RNA of the host um, nucleus. So the host nucleus, of course, like for HIV, who does HIV attack? Who do we know? Is it B cell or T cell? T cell. Which T cell? Is it the T cytotoxic or the T helper that the HIV loves to eat? Not eat. It loves to go inside and do what? Use its DNA and RNA, right? Right? And then to do what? To just grow. That's all its function. But the problem is the T helper cell or the CD4 plus cell is what? Crucial to my immune system. And when that thing goes down, I don't have memory cells. I don't have an antigen presenting cell. My thugs don't know who, who the phagocytize, right? A lot of bad things happen. And they happen because that thing got in. So right now you might be thinking, well, that guy's so small. Mask is useless. Or um, uh, my neighbor did something really funny um, during the pandemic. Um, he's, also, uh, he's also a professor. But he's a professor of psychology and he loves playing kind of nice. He's also a jerk. But he wore a level two mat. He wore a, a level two suit. Uh, well, it looked like a level two suit. He got it at Party City, right? And then he got one of these things online that sprays, you know, lights all over. And he was like this at the bus stop. He goes, hey, Nelson. And he goes, and, and, and it was like one of the last days right before the pandemic. He was doing it and he's spraying himself and spraying the kids, spraying my kids. And I go, and he's like, what are you spraying? He goes, 70% isopropyl alcohol. And I'm like, please don't do that. And I go, Jerry, that's funny and all, but please don't do that. Right? And then, because why? First of all, we didn't understand that the reason why we wear PPE is, remember the 250 other things that can make me sick, lower my immune system? Like I said, 40% of you already have Epstein-Barr virus already inside you. It's already there. But our immune system keeps it what? non virulent non-pathogenic. But the second you get sick, what happens? Right? Right now, my bronchitis is coming back. Why? I'm in the middle of doing my taxes. What's happening to my stress level? Pissing me off? Oh, this morning I was like, mm -hmm. right? So what's happening to my immune system? It's going to go down. So what's happening to my bronchitis? It's getting what? Worse. So when you look at viruses, they're already there and they already can get inside. So I goes, so you're not wearing the mask to protect you from the virus. You're wearing the mask to protect you from the 249 other things that are going to lower your immune system. And we're going to be talking also about the different types of infections. You're wearing the mask, and we'll, we'll talk more about that, right? That's why when that thing came out, wear the mask is you're saving my grandma. Am I really? Grandma's like 100 years old. What happens to her T cells? Remember? When is the height of your cellular immunity, your T cell? When you were what? 17, puberty. What happens after that? It goes, it goes down. Fungi, it's a plant, it's a fungus. Also known as a mycosis. If we remember um, our medical terminology, the suffix osis means what? Those of you who ace my class. Osis. What does osis mean? So if I'm psych, if I have a psychosis, is that a normal or an abnormal thing? Abnormal. abnormal. So abnormal growth of fungus. Remember all the fungus in my shoe? Right? Right? 
Open up my shoe, smells, okay, fine. Am I gonna die? No, but if I have fungus on my tongue, maybe you've seen it. Uh, you ever seen a patient, they have like a, a white stuff, it looked like they uh, ate some oatmeal and it got stuck. Then you take a tongue depressor, you scrape the tongue and then they start bleeding. He goes, well, that's a fungus. My patient is immunocompromised. Remember the 200 some odd things in here, right? Well, guess what's also in there? Potential for fungus, potential growth, right? And frequently in individuals, not frequently, it is a diagnostic criteria for HIV, HTLV, and any immunocompromised state is a fungus. So fungus, think plant, mycoses, right? Think immunocompromised. My patients are already down. The defense is already down. And when you see the fungus, okay, it's a problem. Protozoa. Now, P for parasite. And we already know what parasites do. Parasites, they latch onto the host because they need it. Just like virus. A virus is kind of... Uh, 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 chemically and biologically considered a parasite because the virus doesn't have everything they need to live on their own, so they do what? Those of you who have some family members know what I'm talking about, right? They're hanging out on the couch. I got a couple in my basement, right? They're hanging out, and what are they doing? They're eating. They're surviving off of what? The host. Now, the thing about protozoa is they love dead or dec decaying organic matter, right? So, if you ingested contaminated food that uh and the, uh, how many of you here uh like worked at a deli or a restaurant or whatever right remember when osha department of health came in they came in with their little thermometer gun and the little things right they wanted to check the soup they wanted to check anything liquid why because if it is there for a period of time things what decay and, and get dead well and it's because of temperature so if your food isn't uh, I remember I worked for this buffet. It had to be like, we had, we had, we, I don't know what the number was, but I just remember it was lava hot. Like it had to like burn your tongue because you probably had, you know, E. coli, God knows what in it. Right? There's dead and decaying things in there and contaminated food. And uh, we're also going to talk about insects as well. But uh, protozoa, I want the, the main things off of this slide, they're parasitic, they come from dead things. And uh, very common in uh, contaminated food, contaminated water, contaminated liquid. Uh, there's something uh, that the Department of Health calls brackish water. Have you ever had like, uh, like maybe in your side yard or whatever, uh, you had a puddle that is always there? Take a good look at it. There's stuff in there, isn't it? Right? But nothing happens to it. It just sits there. Right? Take a look at it. Also, put your nose by it. It smells. Right? Like you won't smell it, but just by standing, but if you go real close, it smells, then you see stuff in it, odds are there's a little protozoa in it. Right? And protozoa, it's big on uh, really bad types of diarrhea. And like I said to the clinical people, especially medical assistants, look up the different types of diarrhea. It's very important clinically because diarrhea, uh, you'd be amazed how many people it kills. Right? We're, we're, we're so focused on these, like, you know, uh, these these um, um, high-profile diseases like Ebola or whatever. Well, diarrhea will kill you a lot quicker than Ebola. Yeah, um, question. What was the main thing? Main thing is what? P for protozoa, parasite, dead things, right? Now, do you see what I'm doing? This is already condensed, right? But when you're doing your active listening, you have to look at this. What, what is my takeaways? And what are the key words that are going to pop out during a question? So if I could have a question like this, which of the following is a single cell parasitic organism that we found in uh, uh, contaminated food uh, that had decaying or mat organic matter in it? You'd go, what? Oh, that's protozoa, right? It's particularly nasty, especially this type of diarrhea. Rickettsia. Now, rickets. Now, rickets to me, Ick, ick, it sounds like the word tick, doesn't it? So I want you to think, please take mites and lice, right? And they're what? Parasites. If you got kids, they got lice, right? There's always one kid. 
probably one of my kids was the point source. Who knows? And um, back in the day when children actually used to play outside, please take some mics. So those of you who love, um, I have a whole bunch of friends who got into hiking uh, after the pandemic. Come on, Nelson, let's go on a hike. And I'm like, no thanks, right? So you go, and, um, you, when you go hiking, right? Now, do you wear, like, if you ever uh, um, really look at people who really do hiking, or uh, those of you in the military know that what? Do I, do I wear shorts when I go on a bivouac? No. Why? Because you're going to brush up against what? Um, uh, br um, bushes and trees and whatnot. And bushes and trees and whatnot have fleas, ticks, and mites. And once they get onto your skin, your skin has a lot of blood vessels. And they love chomping on you. And that's when you get the itch. And they, they're essentially eating. And, and they're intercellular, meaning what? It's something that you can actually see. So they please ticks, mites, and lice, right? Oh, by the way, lice jumps. Let me tell you the story. I was in EMS, right? We, got, um, we had a, a homeless man with a fungating mask on his chest. Now, fungating is not just fungus. Fungating means it's like whatever this thing is, it's eating away at the wound in his chest and was burrowing a hole into his lung. That was already gross as this. Well, me and Julio, of course, we do head to assessment, then we have to cut away his clothes. But we stopped because when we opened up, uh, when we opened up his jacket, and it was like, like, I don't know, eight degrees outside. We opened up his jacket, we saw that mask that had like a little tunnel in it. Well, the tunnel had buggies in it. And we were like, oh. So, of course, we're in the emergency room. We tell, uh, we, we tell the doctor that. The doctor goes, okay, um, not in a lot of room here in the ER. Let's go to this other ward. Uh, it's just a floor or two up. And I'll go, I go, if you can help me just, because he was still on our journey. And remember, we, um, uh, those of you, anyone here at EMX or did an ambulance or did any of that? Remember, you cannot, you must have, like, you can't just, like, leave a patient in the middle of the hallway. Hey, I'm done. Can I have my gurney? You have to endorse it. And that's what, and it's a process. So we're there, and I remember, she was a lovely petite, it goes, uh, 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 doctor and she was in there. And then out of the corner of my eye, I'm sleepy, but I see what? Yeah. Well, I saw rickettsia. And then I saw another one. Then my partner Julio woke up with and if you've ever seen the transport um, elevators in a hospital, they're stainless steel and they're all, you know, they're not, they're only made for a gurney and maybe one or two people. Right? So I'm actually standing on the gurney because I'm petite. I could do that. Right, well, back then I'm petite. Now I'm it's the opposite of petite, right? I was a good one, buck 40, buck 35 when I was in EMS. So I was standing on it, right? And I'm and then I saw another one, and then another one. And then now everyone's like this. And out of all the times, just to go up two floors, it was going up so slow. So I learned really quick that this stuff can also what? Jump. So even if you stay on the trail, don't you think it can also get on you? And after you go on the trail, what should you do? Right? Check your shoes. That's why you don't put your shoes in your in your bedroom, which I love doing. Me, I have adopted. Um, uh, the Asian culture is we put the shoes not only for hygienic reasons, like you know near the door. Uh, my wife's very serious about that. And then she has downstairs slippers and then upstairs slippers. I don't believe in any of that. I walk around with whatever I walk around. With. I paid a mortgage, so I think I should walk around. Well, don't you think those mites, ticks, and the rickets can also stay on your shoes, on your socks, and whatnot? And uh, those of you who had me for, um, for medical terminology, uh, now that my wife is also a medical professional, even though this is my outfit, I have a separate um, hamper in the basement for me. Because why? I'm exposed to medical professionals, right? My wife is working at home and the kids and goes, and the kids have their own hampers. That's how type A my wife is. She does five different sets of laundry for five different sets of people because so that there's no cross contamination, which by the way, they do that in the hospital as well. But here's the funny thing, I'm still sick. 
I can still get that if I'm walking around. So think what? Rickets, ticks, ricky tick, fleas, mites, lice. They're intercellular, meaning they'll jump on you, right? And then do what? Live. That's gross. Ugh, one of my worst. Helmet. Worm. Remember I told you um, uh, we were in Newark and we did a, a it's called the scotch paper, uh, I'm going to scotch tape test. Scotch tape test. You take a tongue depressor and then you wrap around the sticky part and then sco uh, scotch tape. You put it on the butt of uh, kids. Give it a minute, you're going to get eggs. About 35%. Next pin one. So a lot of uh, medical missions, we do a lot of deworming for the pediatrics. And I can tell you, in a more closed, lower socioeconomic environment, that 35% will even go higher. And uh, if anyone knows about Newark, New Jersey, they made it really nice looking, but it's still Newark, New Jersey, right? Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Newark, New Jersey. There's still a law since the 80s because Newark, New Jersey used to be the carjacking capital of the world. You can run red lights at 10 p.m. after 10 p.m. if you do not feel safe, right? I don't drive my car in Newark. I went to school in Newark for both graduate school and medical school. That place, uh, those of us who grew up in not so uh, optimal environments, you know when your spidey sense goes up? Every time I cross the border from Jersey City to Newark, I'm like, Okay, whatever we need to do, let's get the fudge out of here. I do not feel safe. And then my son's like, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. And I go, I don't care. He goes, don't you think we can all get killed at 10 05 in the morning? And right, and uh, you guys know my son, the Marine, his spidey sense is ultra sensitive, not even 15 minutes later. He's like, I got two contacts that have been following us for the last five minutes. <laughs> and I go, and he was like, and he goes, move. And he goes, no. I go, went in the car, let's just go someplace else. Because I went there. I don't know why. I wanted to show my kids, look, this is where daddy almost failed out of medical school, right here. This building right here where Papa threw up because he failed this exam. Oh, you know, there's another place where, I, and then my daughter goes, you threw up a lot. And I go, failed a lot of stuff too. But helmets, worms, eating uncooked meals, inadequately cooked meals, or contamination of food and water. And they're parasitic and they love the GI. But me, I got hit by a bunch of worms that love what? Lungs. Ugh. So that's what actually uh, my pulmonologist is saying, that um, because of years of smoking and um, the damage in my right lung, that's probably what's causing my bronchitis and asthma-like effects. I'm like, thank you, worms. Thank you for giving me that. Well, also the 15 years I've been smoking, so that, that'll do it. So helmet. So the way I remember it is, I look at a worm and I think it's like wearing like a helmet. I don't know. It may or may not help me. So if my worm, if my if my patient has a parasitic worm infection, you're gonna think what? Right? You're gonna think helmet or helminthes. So if my patient is taking an antimycotic, they're taking a medication against what? Bacteria, fungus, or protozoa? Fungus. If my patient is taking an anti-helminthic, what are they taking? They're taking a drug that's against what? Worms. And you get pinworm, that's what we're gonna give your kid. Now, how does this all work? I don't know why the author didn't do uh, the picture because let's do a picture because I don't like words. I like pictures because I'm a simple guy. And because I'm a visual guy and words don't do it for me. I like pictures. I like something, here's one. Okay, let's go over this picture in context of uh, uh, the, um, the words. And they're the same words. So you see this is, it's, it's called the chain of infection. 
And it starts with what? The last six or eight slides that we're talking about. It has to start with some sort of infectious agent. So bacteria, protozoa, helminth, whatever, okay? And of course, that's the source, right? And that source, oh, by the way, this infectious agent, right? Now, we talked about biological sources for the infectious agent. Uh, there are also chemical sources, okay? Right, so if you got poisoned or you poisoned yourself, for example, uh, don't you think drug addicts get a certain amount of diseases? Yeah, they get, they get things. Um, alcoholics too, don't you think they are more susceptible to certain diseases? So the infectious agent, yes, we talked about the biological ones, but they could be chemical. And I just mentioned smoking. It could be physical too. Also, some of us grew up in non-optimal environments, right? I hate using that term ghetto because ghetto actually just means uh, the original uh, derivation of the word ghetto is it was just a place where people of, of, of like cultures used to hang out. But then over time, what did people start using it as? They started using it as talking about what? Like bad places. Right, so I like talking about non-optimal environments. Uh, so an infectious agent could also be physical because if I'm in a house that has asbestos in it, if I'm in a house that is not uh, is is uh, um, uh, too hot or too cold, and does anyone ever live like in like rent rent controlled apartments? Sometimes you, you ever see the uh, the old timey heaters that they had in there, you know, the one that got painted, you know, the one that like the radiator and they painted it like 18 different colors and, and it's so thick. Well, that thing never turned off. So how was the air in the room? It was very stagnant. It was way too hot and it was hard to breathe, wasn't it? That's, a, that's what I remember about growing up because not being cold, the exact opposite. I remember being like too hot. Uh, I'm, I'm, my dad got upset because I once, uh, I once slept in the kitchen a couple of times because my room, well, the room uh, was, too, uh, was too hot. We even put a blanket over the radiator because it would be like 90 degrees in that room. Don't you think that stressor can then cause a point source of infection? Now, this source is called a reservoir. A place where the infectious agent, whatever it is, can survive, right? So, and we already talked about the mouth. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's warm, it's got salt, it's got sugar in it, it's dark, right? It's a wonderful environment. Now, this point source of infection is going to talk about, um, 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 something called fomites. Fomites is, it sounds like a bug, but it isn't. Fomite just means that, remember the, the five or six biologicals that we talked about, the, um, the ticks, the, the, the fungus or whatever? Don't you think they can fall on a surface, right? And that surface, you touch it, then you do what? You touch your face. Did you ever, ever see that um, that video? It was a meme where uh, I forgot it was a government official that said, was, "Hey, we'll all be good as long as you don't touch your face." And what was the first thing she did? She touched her face. Can't not touch your face, right? You love your face. You can't touch it. It's scratching all the time, right? Especially those of you who are smokers. You definitely have a psychological oil fixation. I like smoking so much. Just thinking about it, delicious. <laughs> so a fomite is a point source of infection. It could be a door handle, right? And uh, don't want to gross you all out. I'm going to gross myself. Look at your mouse. There might be schmucks on it. Turn your keyboard over and tap it a couple of times. Oh, look at this. 
there's little stuff that comes out. That's a fomite. That's a point source of, a, a, of contact. So there can be things on there, bacteria, protozoa, anything that can do what? Further the chain of infection. And you could see that I'm always talking about the point source. So you have your infectious agent. Where did that infectious agent end up? And then now, how did it hit my patient? Now, if you look at our patient right here, right? You can see that the patient was already sick, right? Which we're going to talk about here. Okay. But there's modes of transmission. And so let's uh, go to this. How did I get from the source to my patient? Well, let's make this bigger. And again, you have this list. Doesn't, doesn't that scream? Oh, that's a multiple choice of question for this weekend, isn't it? Which of the following modes of transmission does blah, 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 blah. You have contact, droplet, airborne, vehicle, and vector. So let's see, did they? No, of course, they're going to let me do it. Okay, so what's contact? Contact transmission is what? We already heard of that in Corona every day, right? Like watch your door handle, watch your computers, your mice, especially in public, pla uh, public places. Um, and um, uh, during my time, uh, the number one was phones. You still have phones and stuff at uh, in the hospital, right? But now you can see in the hospital, you notice the mouse is uh, covered in plastic. As you guys know this also, the keyboard is covered in plastic. Well, at least at the hospitals that I know of, VCU, I visited recently, uh, I know but definitely, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? The little mouse and the keyboard is all in plastic. We clean that four times a day. And you will also see, especially with the latest um, update in Epic, Epic is the database that um, most popular database here in the DMV that we use for hospital operations. A lot of it, um, uh, a lot of it has lesser keystrokes and all mice. Like you don't, you don't type stuff in anymore, right? Um, and um, they also are introducing voice recognition so that they can get the screens down faster. Because uh, my wife works in healthcare administration, and one of the things that we want to do is what less screens, right? More capability of the healthcare administrator getting the information to either the insurance company or the patient much, much quicker, or the doctor much, much quicker. So there's less contact transmission. Another thing that INOVA did was a lot of their healthcare admins, they left them at home. More than 40% of their teams are home because you want them in a place that are that is exposed all day, every day. But we as clinicians, we're techs, we're, we are exposed whether we like it or not. So we have to be aware of contact transmission. The next, droplet. Now, droplet is when you cough or sneeze on somebody. Did you guys ever wonder now, we, let's go back to the mask, right? COVID, a lot of the COVID was what? Coughing, right? Droplet infection. You guys noticed that what? When you sneeze, right, on, on your screen, what do you see? Little speckles. But look beyond your screen at the rest of your furniture. Is there any little dots that you see greater than a meter out from where you just sneezed? No. Now, why is this? And let me show you right here. The heavy droplets will fall right here. So remember we had six feet apart because science tells us what? Droplets fall where? Three to four feet. So what's the best? You being away from me at six feet. What's also the best? I wear a mask, so if I'm talking, right? You ever have a close talker? Or somebody like talking to you and you're like, hey, hey, you can feel their breath. You can feel their breath, right? You, you can, th there's droplets falling on you, right? So that's droplet infection. And droplet infection is relatively close. It's like three to four feet. That's why we wear the mask. 
right? Our PPE, our personal protective equipment, and that's why we stand where? Six feet away. And if you look at the Department of Health, even though, you know, uh, all the protocols are, are, are decreased, if you drop by uh, Department of Health offices, we still have all the plastic glass up. Because even though we're not masked up, the plastic glass is still up. I'm still talking to somebody through what? Through an eight, eighth inch piece of plastic. Why? Because if they talk at me, cough at me, sneeze at me, what will happen? It'll hit the glass, not me. Right? And I'm. when you look at the table, look how far they are. When they're talking, they're like leaning over the table like this. If you ever went to the Department of Health, the table's like this big, things this and. And you can see now why it's not paranoia, right? It's to do what? Break droplet transmission. And you have one poor soul, like every four hours doing what? Wiping down everything. Um, now, droplet transmission, you might, you might confuse it with airborne. Droplet and airborne are not the same thing, right? Now remember, droplet think what? A chew, short. Airborne is what? It travels. The vent. You guys know that being in a closed office is the worst. And where are we all day, every day in the hospital? Even if we had HEPA level six um, uh, stuff in the hospital, everyone still gets sick. And we're going to talk about that. Right. And that's what? Airborne. So think droplet. Two. <laughs> I'm talking to you. It happened where? Right here. But airborne. And here's a classic example of airborne. There's something called Legionnaire's disease. Uh, you know the Legionnaires, they, um, uh, they, they're, they're, you know, they're a group of dudes and uh, they're, they're a social club. They were in Chicago and they were in a, you know, big banquet hall. And then one of them ended up in the ER because of lower respiratory tract infection problem. Then another one, then another one. And then those dudes died. Now it became a what? A scary health thing, but they found out that the air conditioning system wasn't cleaned in a while. And those of us who have like a really cheap air condition, you notice that there's water at the bottom of it. Mm -hmm. And remember what we said about brackish water? That water gets contaminated, and now it's in the vent, and now it's traveling far. It traveled all up and down 12, 14 floors, or whatever, how big um, uh, uh, the banquet hall was. So that's airborne. So think airborne, think what? If I'm telling a story about far away, like the vents. So right now, even though you, I'm inside, I should be good. No, you shouldn't. Just look at that. We clean this regularly. Look at that. You know that dust? All that stuff? We, we clean this so much. Right? But again, right? Still can get it. Now what's vehicle? Vehicle doesn't mean your vehicle. Vehicle means that Something carried it in to your proximity. So, um, so for example, you could get some ticks from your dog or from your, from your cat, right? Um, another vehicle is what? The kid, isn't it? My house, we always look at the kindergarten one. Because we call him patient zero, right? Every time he has sniffles or starts coughing, right? We all like, show him in the basement. He goes, Edison's sick. I'm like, oh, damn. Because what's going to happen in the next couple of weeks? The whole house is going to get sick. So we scrub them up. And, and five-year-olds, do you think? This is what five-year-olds do. You ever see them do this? And then they walk around with snot and God knows what on their hand. And then they're touching everything. Isn't that a fomite infection? Mm -hmm. Right? They touch this. He loves touching my computer, even though he has his own. Right? Loves my DJ equipment. Doesn't really DJ. Just likes to spread mucus. All over a two thousand dollar controller. That's okay. I am hoping it breaks because I am now insured. That's why you have your glass of wine, beer, or sangria next to my turntables. Please spill it. I am waiting for it because I am insured. Get a new set of turntables. Some dude even put it right there, right there, right next to the needle. I'm like, I mean, how did it try to? Man, nothing happened to it. So the difference between vehicle, right? Something brought it in, right? And vector born. A vector, I want you to think bugs. Because what's a vector? 
A vector is a mathematical term that means something is going in a direction and it has some speed. And isn't that a bug? Right, like a mosquito. It's going in a direction, most likely towards you, and it's coming at you at speed. So stuff like malaria, Ebola, that's because of what? Uh, of uh, a vector, which is uh, the mosquito. The mosquito isn't sick. The mosquito inside its little proboscis, which is that needle nose thing that they have, bit me. Oh, what year was that? 96. Next thing you know, I got chills. I'm all messed up. My liver's all messed up because why? So that was the reservoir. So to recap, modes of transmission. Contact, of course, is direct contact. I touch a fomite or something that got infected. Droplet transmission. Think what? Sneezing, coughing within three feet. Airborne, think the HVAC system. Vehicle, something brought it in, whether it was person, place, or thing. But vector, I want you to think bugs. A vector, something that flies. A V. All right, it is now 916. And oh, do, 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 do. let's take 10. And then we could talk more about this thing. And those of you who have yet to sign in the sign in sheet, please do so. How did it get into my patient? So these are some ways. One, remember the story I told you about? Oh, my wife always complains. I smell like this. I smell like that. And I didn't do anything. Promise. Right. And I can't be a business person if I do these things. Uh, like I, I was having, I was, uh, I was trying to uh, garner more business. And I was with uh, uh, a couple of uh, bar managers. And uh, it's the middle of the week. and drinking to excess. And I just have, well, I have a Coke in my hand. Because who has to be straight? Now. If I keep on, like, if I drank something or get exposed to something, I could put a lot in my skin, and it could come to my skin. And that's why, you know, that I'm not a big fan of surgery, because what do we do in surgery? When I cut your skin, don't I now have a beautiful portal of entry for infection? That's why we give you prophylactic um, antibiotics, because I know I'm setting you up. Respiratory tract. That's also another reason why I give you broad spectrum antibiotics. And for a lot of surgeries, what do I do? Don't I tube you? Right? I put you on mechanical ventilator so I can control what goes in, what goes out. Genital urinary. What else? What other tube I put in here? There's the surgical text in the room. Put a tube in your nether region. Why? I want to control those. The, uh, I want to make sure that the urine only goes where? Out. Gastrointestinal, right? I have to be careful of what I eat. Circulatory. Remember we talked about sepsis. If I get bacteria in my blood, where is now the bacteria? It's not everywhere. That's why septicemia is very scary. And of course, in the obstetrics, if mommy has it, what are the odds baby's going to have it? That's why mommy has to go for prenatal care. It's my biggest pet peeve when I was in obstetrics that a lot of my deliveries, I'm probably the only internist you know who's delivered more than 60 babies. Oh, sh even remotely that many. Right? I have, what, 62? I forgot the number already. It changes from term to term. i got to check my, my records. But transplacental, or uh, placenta. Your placenta is uh, the liaison of the go-between between mommy and baby. So... Anything that mommy's doing, baby's doing, right? And I find it amazing how powerful um, illicit drugs are because mommy knows they're bad for you, right? Mommy knows it's going to be bad for baby, but mommy does it anyway because does she have a choice? Uh, that's the one thing I learned about addiction is does your patient have a choice? No. It's like asking us, do you have a choice between eating or dying? That is, it does, that's already locked in. So... If my patient's HIV, I gotta beware. Maybe might be HIV. If my patient's on, on, 
has uh, an alcohol problem, I'm going to look at anything that goes where? Across. Now, the next part, next one, we got to talk after means of entry, we have to have the susceptible host. And remember, we talked about it. We talked about the host has to have their defenses down. Because right now, 250 things can tell us in this room that all our defenses are up. But what happens when our defenses are down? Then the agent that's either already there or the agent that's waiting outside, then it can come in. Immunocompromised. Okay? That means anything that will lower your immune system. Do you know we have millions of people on antidepressants in this country? And we already learned from anatomy and physiology one, because of cortisol, if you have extended stress, which is like depression, anxiety, which we've got tons of in this country. Don't you think that's going to lower their immune system? Don't you notice you get a cold right before major exams? I will always get a call the night before <clears throat> the grand practical for nursing. We have a grand practical for responsible for um, um, you know, one of the 200 uh, anatomical items, and it's an oral examination, and it lightens, it's fast. Five, six minutes, you have to show me a ton of stuff. So it's kind of stressful. What happens the night before? I always get, in a class of 20, two or three emails that go, oh, I'm coughing on this, and I'm like, okay, let's take your exam, then go home. Oh, I don't think I can make it. And then, then you got a zero, with 20% of the grade, I'm going to say. Then they come in, they're all coughing. And they're not lying, why would you lie to me? And if you lie to me, I don't care, right? Remember my job as a facilitator. I am just a glorified secretary. I just record what you either did or did not do. Don't get compromised. Very easy. I had one of my seniors. Um, uh, it's called clerkship syndrome. Clerkship is supposed to be a medical school. That's when all these, and especially in uh, the month of uh, the month of love and Valentine's. This particular nurse candidate fell in love with another nurse. The other nurse was smart enough to go, hey, no, I need to keep my head in the game because we're seniors, we need to graduate, I need to take my NCLEX. But when she stopped the relationship, what happened to the dude? I messed up. And he got sick. And he was already sick, he had this GI problem, now it's worse. Now he came up to me yesterday, he's crying, he's upset. Oh, my GI problems, I need this, that. And I go, oh, you set yourself up. You're not compromised. Right? And now, what's his health? It's now what? Down here. In a time where he needs it the most. So, those are characteristics that include, influence susceptibility and the severity of the infection. And now you can see why, another reason why medical professionals try to, like, even though we wear our heart on our sleeve, we try to keep our emotions in check. We have a very stressful job, and if I get that, if I let that stress get, get to me, what happens? My adrenal gland makes more cortisol. Cortisol decreases my um, inflammation. And inflammation, is that innate or adaptive? You're born with inflammation. Think inflammation innate. You're born with it. Right? So if I'm decreasing my frontline inflammation, what's going to happen? I'm going to get sick. So then it goes round and round. And this susceptible host then spreads the infectious agent then to another source. Do you see how it goes? So what do we do? You see where we break the infection? What do we do to the infectious agent, right? I test. That's what internal medicine, uh, the Department of Infection Medicine does at least twice a day at the hospital. We test all the areas for fomites. If it lights up, guess what? We shut down the area, we clean it, and we move on with our day, right? And then report it to the rest of the, the faculty who are working there. Uh, source, right? See here, wipes. 
I have protocols, hand washing to prevent the infection. I make sure not only staff but patients wear masks, especially if there's a droplet or an airborne infection uh, suspected. Mode of transmission, hand washing, six feet apart. Means of entry, again, hand washing, PPE. And last but not least, I already have a susceptible host. I'm going to inoculate them. I'm going to do meds. Now, why inoculate? What's in the vaccine? The antigen, right? That's going to make what? Well, antibodies. So that now, you see how all the protocols are there in place for a reason. And now it makes, now all the rules make sense. And if they all make sense, then you won't miss them. So you have cleansing, disinfection, and sterilization, and their levels. What does this mean? Especially for the techs in the room. The cleansing level is just what? Soap and water, scrubbing, with a neutral pH solution. You got to take the schmutz off of it, right? When you look at a um, uh, an instrument, it should be what? Clear of, of those, any little crust or anything like that. Yeah, because you, you ever see that lady in your car maybe you sneezed like a day or two ago? And then you look on your dash and you're like, what is that? Well, that thing was once wet, but now it's dry. It looks like a crumb, which probably came from your lung. A little piece of mucus, it's gross. So what do I have to do? I have to actually scrub it. So if you're asked to cleanse something, you scrub it in a neutral pH, uh, usually some, uh, and, and for your typical office setting, it's usually just soap and water. Now what's disinfection? Disinfection is when I let that instrument or let that area soak in a specific chemical. Now it's the next level, right? You may be using stuff like Cydex and um, all these uh, other chemicals that I totally forgot uh, since it's been like eight, nine months since I, I taught this class. But even medical system. So when they say to disinfect the room, you're not just using soap and water or just light, you know, Lysol. You're, you're doing what? You're using chemicals um, that will clean stuff and like uh, bleach. So think, think what on the disinfection level. Chemicals. And last but not least, especially for the techs and the uh, medical assistants in the room, you're going to learn how to use an autoclave. Autoclave is sterilization. Now, sterilization doesn't mean that I'm killing everything. No. Right? That means um, if you, and this is an autoclave, let me show you guys. Like I said, I love pictures. Um, this is quite an expensive one, but let me find it much cheaper. But you put it in there. Essentially, it's an oven. It's a steam oven. It's under pressure, by the way. And you see this latch here? You will not open it like this because it's under pressure. If, as well, if the safety latch isn't engaged, what's going to happen to the door? It will hit you, and it will hurt you. Right, but nowadays we have safety features and whatnot. But during my time, you ever see the uh, autoclave? It looked like a, I call it Miss Piggy. It looked like a like a stainless steel pig with feet and little snap which was the, the gauges. So it's under pressure. So the sterilization, we not only put it under high heat and steam, we also put it under pressure, and it runs through a cycle, and it either could be wet or dry. Now, in order to get to that sterilization level, so if I say autoclave, you're thinking sterile. Now, there'll be no bacteria maybe for the first 12 hours, and it might either be in a packet or, or you uh, store it in, um, this is, you ever see that blue or green, uh, like it's a cotton in the hospital? It's called muslin. It's a kind of cotton that uh, it got coated and it's very non-pathogenic. Um, bacteria and viruses don't like sitting on it for a long time. 
which by the way, we can also autoclave as well. We can autoclave um, linens and, and uh, um, material, right? And non-latex gloves and, uh, and things like that. There's a whole bunch of things you can autoclave and you're gonna learn that in your clinical classes, right? So in order to get to that level, remember this? Cleansing, disinfection, and sterilization. In order to get to the sterilization level, you have to cleanse it first, then let it soak, and you're disinfected, and then you sterilize it, and then you go through all these things. Now, when you sterilize it, especially if you sterilize it through a pouch, what do you do? There's a protocol where you put your name, you put the date, you sign it, and you put uh, which surgeon or which OR they it's for, all of that. But the important part is the date and time. Because after a week, the thing that you all uh, play today, is it good next week? No. Actually, there's a lot of surgical places that within 24, 48 hours, they'll rebake everything. They'll make you do, re-cleanse everything. Especially if, um, uh, let's say for example, obstetrics, especially if the, the speculum is invasive. Like the vaginal speculum, you know that's what, that's invasive, you're going to, um, I, I want that at the level of sterilization. So, level one, cleansing. Brush, soap and water. Number two, disinfection. I let it sit, depending on uh, what protocol you're using. Uh, I let it sit in some chemical. And then after that chemical, right, I dry it out. Uh, and uh, sterilization is the final level. And I could use something like an autoclave. Or, uh, yeah, autoclave is typically, and it uses, and it can be either dry or wet. It uses steam and pressure to kill everything. Does that look like a beautiful multiple choice question? I could explain the situation and you'll tell me what level of disinfection it is. I mean, what level of, uh, uh, of, of uh, cleaning it is. Is it a cleansing level, disinfection level, and sterilization level? And remember, to get to the sterilization level, oh, it used to kill me. When people skip this part, if you don't get the schmutz off of your uh, surgical equipment and you bake it on there, uh, by the way, how much does the, uh, 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 you know, forceps and all those cost? Especially if they have the gold ring around it. Um, a lot of surgeons, gold is a much softer um, material, so they can feel it better. They have a feel to it. I'm not a surgeon, so I can't tell the difference. 99 cent versus $999 for sets. They feel the same to me, but uh, my surgeon buddies tell me, no, it's really special. Oh, by the way, when you clean these things, do you, do you clean it like you clean your spoon and fork in your house? No, you clean it what? With care, right? And do you do stuff like this? How many times I've seen a tech do that or a medical assistant do that? You're killing me. It's a $150 for set and you're doing this. Gonna, it's gonna tick me off, and I'm gonna simply find somebody else to uh, to have your job. But you do it what? Take your tongs, you nicely put it in the tray. Then the next one, you nicely put it in there. You have the timer for the disinfection. You follow all the protocols of sterilization. How many times, even in training, right? I tell them, hey, watch the safety door. Watch this. Here, and then what? Your nice little catch. Thank goodness. Uh, safety doors work, right? Because the person is not following the instruction. So proper hygiene all the time, clean your supplies, clean linens, and we can uh, sterilize them as well. Um, housekeeping, uh, I don't know if they call, them, call it that anymore. I think they call it environmental services or something like that in the hospital. Do not look lowly upon them. They are the people who empty out the trash. They are the people who take all the biohazardous material, recycle it, and also they take all the linens and keep them what? Sterile or semi-sterile. They're very important. Just as important as uh, everybody else. Now, what's another way to maintain a uh, portal of exit and mode of transmission? Now, what uh, most clinical people, the medical assistants in the room, what's the difference between a bandage and a dressing? What's the difference? 
besides just the word. Dressing has what? Is the what? The thing that's touching the wound, right? And what's the bandage? The bandage is what keeps the dressing in place. This has to be replaced what? Every 24 hours. Or, heck, let's say it's not 24 hours. Where the tech you come in and you see either blood or pus leaking out of it. You go, no, that's nasty, and walk on with the day. No, remove it, and then do what? Find the person in charge, deal with it. Because isn't that a point source of infection? How many times? Stop playing my surgical brother. Yes, I am. How many times I'm I am internal medicine, we do post op. We watch the patient. We're supposed to kind of share that, share a little bit of the activities with the surgery, but surgery is more about what pre-op and perioperation. Right? So post op, I am we look in on them. How many times I'm like, I see this purple jelly-like smelly and it and it smells, it's not smelling as a bad smell, it actually smells like flowers. Guess what? That's an infection. Right? I remember the first time I saw it in third year medical school. I'm like, that's a pretty color. It's like jam. And then the nurse went, damn it. And I'm like, oh, is something wrong? Well, of course, did I study? No, because it, unless it looks like blood or pus, I don't get excited. But now, right, after two, three years of surgical rotations, now I know. I see any odd color, what do I do? I investigate it, I note it down, and it smelled like. Yeah, it, it kind of smelled like, uh, you know, lilac Febreze, but really light. And it was like purple jelly-like, and then had some blood on it. But then that was what? That, that is a pseudomonas uh, um, uh, bacterial infection, and it's a common infection in surgery. But, I, if, but like I said, if I don't see pus or blood, I don't get excited. But now I know. So maintain all the dressings it goes, and, it goes, and the bandages. The dressings. The thing that is directly on the wound. And also, there are some wounds that don't require dressing. There's some wounds that we want to keep open, right? So they can breathe. And sometimes there's a rotation of that. And the bandages, remember those of you clinical people, not too tight, not too soft. Always interview your patient. Hey, how's it going? Ask them to wiggle their fingers. Like if you're putting the bandage on and check for capillary refill. Remember this? Right? And you'll press their finger, it gets like white, right? Or light pink. And then you let go. What should happen? The pink should come back. If you put on the dressing so tight that the pink doesn't come back, what are you doing? Will that wound heal? No, because now you're not getting blood to it. So now the exact opposite. Or the exact opposite. Me, I used to be always scared because the patient would complain it would hurt. If the dressing can slip out by me just pulling it out like this, then you're also rushed doing it wrong. Cover your mouth, you always have. And this is also a neat way. You know you have to wear your mask, and in a lot of places, um, especially the ones who are high in RSV, I know for a fact that uh, we've seen that change the protocols. Everyone's got the shield, the shield mask. So they not only have the mask, they have the shield at VCU, right? And what are we doing? We're against droplet infection and 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 I told you guys this. Well, I told the medical term stories. Remember, I told you guys, my colleague, that one time she didn't wear her mask because um, mommy didn't have any prenatal care and baby was coming out really fast, so she was just wearing the smock. She gloved up and went like this. But what happens sometimes when mommy pushes? Stuff comes out and stuff flies out. So all the afterbirths and all that stuff. Went in her mouth and her face. And she was there. Now, can she continue? No, now she's a point source of infection. She has to step out, right? This is also the other bad thing. The midwife next door didn't wear her mask either, and it's all over her, too. So I'm walking by, they're like, no, no, no. I'm like, man, I just delivered. Oh, now I got it. I learned that lesson. I always go up, I mask up because what? How many times? Right? And mommy feels really bad about it, but you should feel worse because you should know better. Gloves, all times. You don't have the right. Um, uh, and also, those of you who are going to get into it, know your size. I hate when newbies don't know their size. They're like, hey, I think I'm medium. 
And then what? It's floppy. Oh, I think it's a small. And then it goes right through. Um, surgical, know your number. Know your surgeon's number. Know everyone's glove size. And have it all laid out. I hate that because I'm a little bit petite. And I don't see my six. What up? And now I'm standing there. I just scrubbed. What's happening to my hands? Right? It's starting to get contaminated, isn't it? And it goes with detective and layout, lay out the stuff, right? I'm, I'm going to have a problem with it, right? But I'm not in surgery, so that didn't happen too often. And actually, I'll be honest with you, it happened because I gave him my wrong number. Um, HCP is healthcare professional. Wash hands in between patients. Now, uh, who here knows how to wash their hands and do a, a clinical scrub? Anybody? No? Anyone? So how do you do a clinical scrub? Explain to me. I'm new. Hey, the doctor said I washed my hands wrong. Well. You tell me how I wash my hands. Okay. Do I turn it on with my hands? Either it has the infrared, or you use your elbows, or you use the knee thing, or you use the foot pedal. He goes, can I touch anything with my hands? No. Next. Keep on going. So you rinse them. Okay. Rinse. In between the fingers, under the nails, under the thumb, under the, the wrist. Great. Now, at the level for a clinical scrub, it should be where? Only at the level, a little bit above the wrist. All right? And whatever you do, it's the matter. What you did on the left, you did on the right. Now, here's the crucial part. How long? Uh, for a surgical? No, for a uh, clinical scrub. 20 seconds. 20 seconds or... What are we all here uh, during uh, uh, during COVID? Okay. Right? No, we all heard uh, you see uh, what was it? See the alphabet? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like uh, our happy birthday twice. Now, here's the thing why I'm mentioning it. Remember I told you guys I did CCMA prep and RMA prep and MAs? Well, during the pandemic, that question came out like, how many times you sing happy birthday? And I'm like, what? Where's my 20 seconds? Where's my one minute? Right? 20 seconds if it's what? You're doing like, but keep it closer to a minute. If you know, you're going to have the blood. Well, you're always going to be blood in if you're going to go invasive. Okay? And dental, the same, because it's just as, you know, actually during the pandemic, you know who better at following the protocols? Dental people. The dental people, they were all following all the protocols. And I find it very funny that the medical assistants of the nurse were like, because as the day goes long, you start doing shortcuts. No, 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 no. Especially now in this day and age of litigation and liability and everyone's on camera, do the protocol the same way for each and every patient. It's annoying, but then what happens to the level of infection in the hospital and the facility? It goes down drastically. So your hand washing protocol and for surgery, it's much longer, right? And much more intense. That's why you probably have a nurse standing right there looking right at you. And how many times I'm about to leave, she goes, ah, uh -uh. and then you have you up. And, and you are also scrubbing with data dye and the little brushes. And the little brushes for surgical come with um, a, a little like nail pick. Now, even if you have nothing, nubs, you're supposed to go under your nails, and this is called your lunula. You're supposed to scrub in between there as well. And then do everything. And then you look at the nurse and she goes, what? Oh. And then you go, what? You just cover and then you're rinsing out. You go, mm -hmm. nope. Because we have to add those. And sometimes it's a tech, right? But either way, it goes, uh, I, the surgical, it has to be a far greater level of asepsis than clinical, right? So think clinical, 20 seconds or a happy birthday song. And if it's really invasive, you're doing something invasive, like uh, for obstetrics, like a speculum. And you know, speculum, I have to put it per vagina. I'm putting something inside of you, or if I'm swabbing you, uh, uh, make it more than 20 seconds, uh, make it closer to a minute. Question. Okay, well, I might have an answer that's okay. Uh, no, everything in the hospital is ramped up. Like, so the hand sanitizer you get commercially is one thing. The hand sanitizer in the hospital, that's why your um, 
Um, and this goes for both ladies and men. There's, if you also see the hand sanitizer station, there's also um, a um, moisturizer station right next to it. I used to be one of those people who ignored it all the time. And then what happens in the course of the day, your hands get really dried out. And then by the time, you know, you start seeing little cuts and little stuff, right? Um, a moisturizer. Now, if you're allergic to certain things, that has to be communicated with the chain of command. Um, um, before you guys work in any facility, there's a um, um, there's an onboarding procedure where they ask you all these questions. Like, what are you allergic to? And, and also they ask you things like, how much do you carry? Um, do you have any other ailments? And, oh, I don't have that I'm going to put in my... You know, and they get that all on paper so that everyone knows and understands what everyone has as a team and can do what well, their job. So if you're allergic, because I had some people who are allergic to this, that, and other thing. Um, um, and what's neat about Epic, right? It'll warn you. It'll uh, it'll warn things like, uh, let's say I put I put a, a nurse and a physician on a schedule, and that person just came back from surgery. And it's not allowed to carry things over ten pounds, right? I go, oh, it will, it will set a flag, and then and I go, why? Then you click on the flag, and it will tell you, oh, this person can't, is not allowed to handle this, that, the other thing, right? Um, <laughs> someone put a flag on me. Goes, uh, uh, Dr. Grice has a has a problem with substance abuse patients, and I'm like, come on, man, that's it. Because, you know, I just. Because when I was younger, I used to, I used to have a, always have a prejudice, but I have a prejudice again uh, when I was younger uh, for substance abuse people because I can't work on your grandma because I'm working on this cat. This guy or gal will not die. Your grandma is dying. But since the goes, since he was in, uh, goes on my roster, I, he deserves my time. But remember what I learned? When we're doing an exam, do I get to pick and choose my patient? No. And I should focus on one patient at a time and make that patient my priority. Uh, uh, I told you guys the, the Nazi patient, right? Guy's a neo-Nazi. He's a piece of garbage. But he's my responsibility. He was saying racist this, racist that. And this is the crazy part. This is a hospital in the Bronx, New York. Is there, is, is there anyone there who's going to be sympathetic to his politics? Of course not. And to make it worse, my boss is Jewish. So he didn't want to go see him. Nelson just handled it. I'm like, I'm a second year resident. I'm like, I'm like I can't sign up and stuff. Then Cassidy goes, this, puts a flag, goes, oh, Nelson's fully in charge of this patient. What? Um, that's not good, right? Even the seniors didn't want a piece of this guy. It was every day, race war, every day, this and that. What would we do? I got all the people together. Hey, hey gang. We do this right, let's get this guy out of here. He goes, and let's do it right, best service, let's get this guy out. Because the quicker we all move, the quicker we can get this guy out of our service. Agreed? Agreed. No one engage up on him. Everyone just what? Say, hello, sir. Goodbye, sir. Do your job. That's it. So did we have any other incident? Nope. He was out of my service in nine days. And you know what's crazy? He gave all of us a glowing recommendation and uh, a high patient satisfaction patient satisfaction rate. Uh, typical patient satisfaction rates usually a scale, a Likert scale from one to 10. We got like an eight, nine. Uh, and, uh, uh, and you know what, he didn't even say thank you or anything else, but do we care? No, we just want him out of there. He started bothering other patients as well. What was he there for? Um, he had complications of diabetes uh, and I got him in my ER. He didn't want to stay, but then he went septic and then he became my patient. And then I didn't think anything of it, right? Because his, uh, he had, you know, the gown on. Then when we transferred to the ward, um, um, I, I heard some ruckus. Um, the lady who was cleaning him up then saw all, you know, all the Hitler tattoos and the swastika and that stuff. And uh, she was a nice Jamaican lady, but she didn't appreciate those things. And also she didn't appreciate the stuff he was saying to her. And then of course I have to intervene. Right, uh, because it's my ward, you have to keep the peace, right? But man, all the nurses are like, what are we gonna do with Dr. Gross? And I'm like, no, let's not, let's stop talking like that. That was the first thing when we all got together, what are we gonna do to him? We are gonna give the best damn service. 
and we're going to get them out of here fast. When it went to the fifth, sixth day, well, that guys, I don't know. And I'm like, I called people for But it was hard, to be honest with you. It, it, was, it was hard dealing with that guy. But again, am I there to like my patient? Am I there to be their best friend? No, I'm there to give them the best possible care. And for this care, and, this, and for this guy, I'll, I'll, I'll. actually, in real life, do you guys get the feeling that we're trying to get rid of you in the hospital? Do you get the feeling that you're not wanted there, that we're, we're trying to rush you out? Let's be honest. I hope you do, because we're going to talk about uh, nosocomial infections. A nosocomial infection is an infection that you get when you're in a facility in a hospital, because in the hospital, there's no well people. Everyone's sick. So what happens to the uh, level of uh, uh, virulence and pathogenicity? It goes up, doesn't it? That's why on your third hospital stay, within 72 hours, you're going to get a low-grade fever. Anyone remember that? Anyone stayed in the hospital more than two, three days? Then we started giving you antibiotics. Well, so the patient doesn't feel like, well, I'm not really that sick for that, but we're doing well. We're preventative. Right? What are we trying to do? I'm trying to eliminate infection before it begins. And you know, I'm internal medicine. Once you guys get sick, there's not much I can do for you. But what can I do? I can do preventive measures. I don't know what UTD means. I don't know what that is. Look that up. And why exercise? What? Why would I prescribe my patient to do exercise, especially in uh, geriatric? Circulation. I gotta move. Yeah. Anyone? Anyone ever been in a hospital? Just sit there. After a day, you get weird, and you start what cramping up, and it, you gotta move around. Now, what's another reason? A heart, right? Because if you don't use it, you Lose it. So you have to keep tone, happy air. And of course, here's also the beauty of exercise that we know physically. And that's why we love uh, physical therapy, right? What we know about exercise is it not only lowers um, cholesterol, it not only lowers blood sugar. So I don't have to give you insulin, right? You get the sugar in. And once you get the sugar in, inside the cell, don't you think the sugar then can be the fuel for your immune system? Yes. Right, and let's talk about mentally. Has anyone ever had a bad workout when you think about it? Even like uh, those of you who do go to the gym regularly, like, there are days where what? You're not, you're not putting on, you're not, you're not feeling it, but you're there. But then when you walk out, don't you feel like at least I did something, right? And I can tell you right now, guess what we found out in the last 15 years? The American Psychiatric Association, along with the American College of uh, Sports Medicine, found this out. Remember I told you about the millions of people who are on antidepressants? Guess what increases dopamine and histamine receptors, which are both related to major depressive disorder? Exercise. And American Heart Association says, in order to get those levels, you only have to work out three times a week for 40 minutes. Just three times a week for 40 minutes, and you don't have to be on those meds. When I left medicine, I went into a major depression. So what, even though I was working, I was doing stuff, right? I had the discipline just to keep on going, right? My mom goes, hey, let's try some meds. I tried it for like six months. Um, and it made me weird. It made the world fuzzy, right? Like, I wanted to be angry, but... The meds made me numb. I don't want to feel that, right? But how's this? Instead of being angry, because I, uh, and I was one of those people, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm your typical, like, you know, um, adult male. Like, I don't need help. Uh, I could do it all on my own. Sound familiar, guys? Get therapy. Now, all that, you know what therapy does and exercise and regular exercise do? It gives you an outlet for all of this anger, all these problems. Because remember when you were kids how fun it was? Because you had absolutely no responsibility. But now as an adult, isn't it like sometimes soul-crushingly hard? 
That's why last night I had to stop doing my taxes because I was getting angry to the point where I was taking my slipper and I was hitting the monitor, my beautiful LG monitor. And then my wife goes, hey, and I'm like, I'm going to break this thing. You know, I was blaming politicians. I was blaming the world. I don't know. I, I went on a rant about scientists. I don't know. The whole family was like, well, get out of his way. You know what I did? 10.30 at night, went downstairs. I went on the treadmill and just walked. And then just watched random YouTube for 30 minutes. What did I do? Emptied out my head. And I got upset. I shouldn't have got upset. What did I do? Emailed my therapist this morning. Hey, you guys, you have some time to do a Zoom later today? I'm not feeling it because I need to get where back to where middle and all of us go off the edge, right? How many of us have major depression where you can't even get out of your bed? How many of us have such anxiety that sometimes I'm afraid to drive? I can't go to, I told you guys a story at Walmart. Every time I go to Walmart, I get into some business. So every time I got to go to Walmart, I have an anxiety. So what do you do? What's up? Talk to somebody about it. And one more told you guys can't talk to family. Never. Because I talk to my mom, I talk to my wife, the closest women to me. What are they saying? Knuckle up. Then he goes, You're from a family of warriors and soldiers. Well, that's what my mother says to me. And she goes, and you go, Are you not a man? And I'm like, oh, I don't need to do it. Right? And this is from my mother. But my therapist does what? Listens. That's all he does. Doesn't judge. Isn't that awesome? And then I vent out. And then he will like, see you next month. And I go, cool, bro. And then when I walk out of there, I feel good. And it's all because of what? Remember when we were kids? Uh, sticks and stones when I break my bones. And words will never hurt me. That's the biggest fallacy. Words are the most damning things in the world. You ever hear something from somebody important in your life? And they didn't mean it, but it came off as what? When my mom says that to me, knuckle up. My father used to say that to me all the time. Could be in a girl, knuckle up. I'm like, Roger that, moving. Right? And before I get off on my soapbox, right? Those of you who have children, if you don't deal with your demons, who gets to have them? The kids. Why do you think my son's a recon operator? He should be in IT. He should be in someplace safe. But what did I tell him his whole life? Knuckle up. Be stronger. Be better than who you are. So he was like, I'm going to join the Marines. I joined 0311. I'm infantry. And then I said, be better than who you are. I'm going to Indoc. I'm going to jump. I finished recon school. I finished SEER. They're deploying me out in this place called the Sudan. And I'm like, Jesus. And I go, you get to fight ISIS today. And he's like, good. But you know what? You know what he has that I didn't? Therapy. He gets to vent out. So how is he? It's fine. He has a god awful job. Whatever higher power you believe in, but he's fine. Because why? He's looking at the balance, isn't he? The whole entire life is here. And those of you in the military know what the form is what? Very stressful. Very, very lonely. And then you come back to the real world, you find out what? No one gets you. No one. Who gets you? Talk to your therapist. So you guys have a free one. Right before I get off my soapbox, look at the posters outside, and it's good. It's helped a lot of my students in other universities. And remember, what's the best thing? You just need somebody to talk, right? So when I give you an email, hey, can we talk about your grades? Don't think of it like, oh, I'm gonna go to the principal. <laughs> think of it as someone here is gonna be a facilitator for your success, and that's me. I'm gonna give you some tricks of the trade to fix what's currently broken. So if I email you, something's broken, and we don't have a lot of time to fix it. We're already in week two. This is only a five-week program, right? So start looking at the world like that. Start helping your patient. And remember I told you guys about nurses? In the DMV, pre-pandemic, 30% will quit in five years. Don't you think if we looked at the statistics of techs and medical assistants and everybody else in this world, it'd be the same thing? Yep. Because we need to get what? In the middle. Now, remember this infection? You have localized or systemic. So you ever had a cut that went bad? And this area got a little bit fuzzy and red and, and maybe you couldn't move your fingers too much? That's local. So remember we talked about septicemia? 
If this infection doesn't get taken care of, what do I got? I got a systemic problem. And if you have a systemic problem, that means it's what? Everywhere. And it goes in a pattern. Incubation, prodromal illness, and convalescence. What's incubation? Incubation is from the moment you got hit until you got symptoms. Okay. You ever was sitting next to uh, your buddy, right? Maybe at work. Your buddy's sick. And you're like, oh, man. I hung out with him. Right? And then you don't feel anything for like a day or two. And then what happens? In that incubation period, the bacteria started growing. So in that day or two, you thought you were well, but you're not. Then you get hit. So let's say it started on a Monday. It's now Thursday. Now you're feeling well. Yeah, a little soft world, a little itch. That's the incubation period. Now, what's prodromal? Pro means before. Now, that little itch, it's not bothering you too much. So, did you take Tylenol or anything? No. Then, on Thursday, you start coughing. Thursday night, you still have a, you now have a fever. So, that's the prodromal period. The period of the initial symptoms to when the symptoms got bad and started becoming alarming. And now you're in well. Once you got that fever, right? The sore throat now is a lower respiratory tract infection. You're coughing. The mucus is a uh, rainbow colored, right? It's red, it's brown, yellow. You're now in a full bone illness. Then over the weekend, you get better, right? You take some meds. What happens? The mucus starts going away. The cough gets a little bit better. That's called convalescence. So could I ask you these stages? Does it not look like a beautiful list? Does that look like A, B, and C, and D? So as a review, which of the following is when uh, I have no symptoms and it's the time of when the port of entry, the pathogen got in me and I had initial mild symptoms, incubation. My mild symptoms started to uh, progress, right? But they're still relatively mild. But I am now symptomatic, prodromal, illness. Full blown illness, peak of my suffering. And convalescence, what happens when you convalesce? You're on the way up. You're on the way down. The good stuff. And you try to get our patient where? Try to get my patient to convalescence and go through the whole process as quickly as possible. And how can we do that? We do that with meds, right? We also do that with uh, uh, medical management, physical management. Now, Reduction in infectious disease, we've been talking about that this whole entire time. Reduction to increase. And remember, the human being is in a vacuum. They respond to stressors. So look at your patient holistically. If your patient is freaking, about, freaking out about the bill, who's the better person to see? You, the patient? Or get somebody from healthcare admin or finance to go talk to them. I told you guys the medical terminology people the story. Um, my, my son needed a specialized surgery, which um, uh, my insurance at the time wasn't paying for. So I was stressed out because the surgery was moving steps, and the initial step cost $48,000. I don't have $48,000. I don't have $48,000. So how was my stress level when I was coming into Arnova? I was pissed off. I was, you know, just like a layperson. Like, this is a scam. At the time, my son was 10 years old. Why are you doing this to a 10 year old? Sound familiar? Right? You know what? I know who saw my stress and saw the way I was talking to my wife. You know who came up to me? Who was just, hi, my name is Judith. I'm with um, financial services. He can me, you have some trepidations about his son's bill. And he goes, yeah, he's going to surgery. Do you think we can talk about this later? He goes, oh no, his surgery's not scheduled until 1130. That's why we asked you to come here early. So your wife and your family can be with your son. And um, I can talk to you right here. Now, did she bring me in her office? No, you saw I know it. It looks like, well, a mall. So this nice little area that looks like what? Well, where you would have coffee with somebody. She had a little walk off the wall with this. some payment option. It's a mess. And then you can, you can hold up your payment for the next three months. So how much time do you get? And she told me back to go off. So that means she read, read the chart. And I'm like, okay. Like, I want to be angry. And she was like, I, I can do that. Okay. And then she did what? Post the laptop. Let me walk you to the pre-op. Uh, uh, 
um, um, Dr. Mandikin is also willing to unpage them so he can talk to you about the procedure. Anyway, I wanted to be angry. I wanted to like, man, this, I wish they could do something. This had terrorism with me. And my wife was talking like that, and the rest of I get, you can't tell from this persona that I had a horrific temper. Right? There's a reason why I was in internal medicine in New York City. Right? I was that was my home. That was perfect for such a toxic environment. But do you see what they did? Now, I'll be honest with you, is I know the best uh, hospital in the world, no, it isn't. But do you see the level of customer service that gives them a 99.2% satisfaction rate? Right? And that's why I don't get that at Fairfax, so I go to Rome. Where do I know? I don't go to Fairfax. Did I get that level of care? And do you see? Even before we saw the clinical personnel, you see how important the healthcare administration personnel and the finance personnel, and those of you who are medical assistants in the room, how many times are you going to be the one to talk the patient down from the ledge regarding their bill? When I was a medical assistant, this is what I always got. What's this? What is this? I'm not paying this. Excuse me. I'm not paying this. And you're like, what the fuck? And you do a bias. But then I learned how to read it. And Oh, what's this? Four one four hundred one dollars. I'm not paying four hundred one dollars. All I have is a little bit of hypertension. No man, it's it's the code. It's four hundred one point one, and you pay your copay and it means you're good. And that's all she needed to hear, right? Because are are patients stupid? No, they look at the numbers and they think it's what. And especially the way they do the coding system, it looks like three numbers and a dot and two numbers. Does that look like money? But that's what. Those are the codes. And so you can see how that, if you look at your patient holistically, and holistic means what? The whole thing. Your patient's lonely, what do you do? Find some time, hang out with them. Right? Can't kill you. Emerging threats, recent, and by the way, uh, remember I told you about Epic? It has algorithms now to uh, predict emerging threats. So you put in all the data into Epic, right? Patient's age or, or whatever. It can tell you who's going to take a fall. It can tell you who's going to get lower respiratory. That, um, and it comes up. It's beautiful. It comes up on a big uh, like screen. And then in the nurse's station, when you look at it, you can see, and it's color-coded. It's really neat. But what are they doing? They are doing what we should be already doing in our head. We should already be taking care of our, our patient and then kind of looking down the road and seeing where the trouble is. Rosocomia infection is one of them. Most common, urinary tract, indwelling catheter, most common. And you can see surgical wounds, pneumonia, right? HAI stands for hospital acquired infection. Nosocomial is the same thing. It typically happens anywhere from 48 to 72 hours after my patient's been admitted. And of course, the dreaded what? Septicemia. And uh, remember my cowboy, 34 years of age, came in with a two centimeter bleeding also at 10.30 a.m. in my ER. Uh, the blood didn't get him, septicemia did. I was writing a death protocol around 1.30, 2 p.m. that day. Uh, well, fortunately for him, he didn't have any kids. But, man, that's a shame. To be that young, 34, jeez. Microbes that cause illness, bioterrorism, eh, nice to know. Eh. But um, you know how terrorists are. Whatever, uh, uh, whatever is the flavor of the day, they're going to find something more interesting. And there's, there's way more interesting things than these. Gloves, hand washing, eye mask, we talked about hand washing, talked about gloves. Eye protection, face shield, gown. Oh, the gown too. Like um, you guys, uh, when you see your the way you guys wear scrubs, uh, if you look at the way the surgical team wears scrubs, the scrubs are tucked in and they're tied down, right? And um, and depending on what department you're in, sometimes they have boobies, sometimes they don't. And just as a little note, remember your scrubs are not streetwear. Do not wear them to the mall. Oh, look at me, I'm a medical professional. No, it's good. Look at me, I'm a newbie who doesn't understand why I wear scrubs. That's like, that's like a soldier walking around in full kit in the mall. 
I mean, you don't need you don't need it for that, right? Uh, so um, and and have it and actually in the hospital, there's a place for linens, and then uh, uh, I don't know about your facilities where you guys go, but even during my time, we go to Central uh, Supply, we get a new set every day. So I come in there in my suit, right? And if I'm in like a mixed room area and I have to wear scrubs, which by the way, I still have to wear my street clothes, I put my scrubs over it. And then if something really extra nasty is happening, I have to do what? Then um, have another set of gown, another set of gloves. And it's all for PPE, personal protective uh, equipment. Now, of course, airborne droplet, that's easy. You mask up. Uh, um, you also have your shield. Contact precautions, of course. Uh, just, just be wary of um, uh, of what you're touching, and also, um, and just uh, take care of your workspace. That's the best. Uh, that's actually the best way. Like right now, I'm coughing up a storm. Am I going to be in the professor's lounge? Right? No, because it's this closed environment. It has no windows. I'm going to get somebody sick. So what do I do? I go in the back or I find a lab that no one uses or that little thing uh, right down there. You'll see me hiding out, skulking in the dark over there because I don't want to affect any of my colleagues. And what do I do after I leave? Actually, what do I do after you guys leave? Um, uh, we, disinfect the, uh, we disinfect the room after you guys leave because there's an evening crew here. And in theory, should have gotten disinfected this morning before you guys came in. So that is Z lecture. What time do I dash? Woo, I'm pretty good on that. So now it's 1023. So um, let us take a quick 10. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to take, um, and, um, and you could have your notes available and whatnot. We're going to take a practice uh, quiz uh, that I already posted. And then uh, we're going to go over all the answers. And also, I'm going to show you how I made the practice quiz so that in future reference, you can make, I was supposed to make a Kahoot, but the Kahoot thing, I don't know why is it targeting me. It's not giving me uh, access because it's always asking me, hey, you can pay, you can pay. The last time I remember, it was free, but I don't know. I sh maybe I shouldn't have used my ecpi.edu uh, .edu, um, email. It was probably algorithm goes, oh, teacher, teacher, money. Uh, I should have just used student in the um, maybe that's why. So let's do, let's do a, 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 a quick 10 and then we'll come back and we'll take the quiz as if it was real. Right? I'll even put a timer up. How many of you get nervous when there is a timer up? Right? Good. What are you now going to do always? Put a timer up until when? You don't notice it anymore. Because, and we'll also talk about time constraints as well. All right. I'll see you in 10. Where is my. And for those of you who didn't sign in the sign-in sheet, please do so. Or forever. Yep. Yep.
Doctor, is there no uh, test exam for Unit 3? Because I don't see any. Uh, I didn't put Unit 3 up yet. Living in the future, madam, when we get to it. <laughs> Oh, well, actually, that's a good idea. I'll always be a step ahead of the professor. Come on, let's put this. Okay. Oh, one more minute. Start. So if those of you see here in announcements, there is a Microsoft Word document labeled Bio 104, Unit 2 Standard Precautions, and it's based on a lecture that we just went over. And let's see, how many, uh, how many questions? So I made 20 questions. So let's make a timer for Typically, a, a multiple choice examination uh, with four items like A, B, C, D uh, can be anywhere from 24 to 34 seconds uh, per question. So I usually give about a minute. So um, this is in uh, announcements under, let me bring it back. It's in announcements under a by 104 live lecture for today. And I'm going to put the video here in a probably YouTube link. Uh, but if you click on here, this is Microsoft Word. 
and as um, uh, these things, these questions. So starting right now, and I'm going to put up a timer um, on a scrap piece of paper or you know uh, or you know whatever. Uh, but take the test, this practice test. Take it in the next 20 minutes, like it is real. <laughs> Okay. Just so you know what I am. So if you look at uh, the order, doesn't doesn't it mirror the order of the lecture? Now, of course, what do I do? I now the nice thing about it is if you do it in the order of your lecture, then you could see where exactly in uh, in my lecture, because you have my videos, where maybe uh, things were misunderstood or things went wrong. So that's one way to also look at it. So when you mark something wrong, you could go back to uh, to around those particular slides and uh, to the video and relook at it on, you know, uh, where was where was the uh, the mistake. So the first one is. E. coli is normally found in the colon. What kind of colonic bacteria is Escherichia coli? Now, we have to look at the definition of what is resident flora, transient flora, and pathogenic flora. The key to this question is it's normally found. So can it be pathogenic? Nope. So I can cross that out. Now, I said normally found. That means it's always found there. Did I say that it came and went? You knew? But we said that, again, normal. So I live there, resident flora or normal flora. Al, pertaining to norm, the norm is the rule. Where should my E. coli be? In the, my colon or large intestine. That's it. <coughs> <coughs> anywhere else it's a problem define virulence it is a disease producing organism what do you think nah nah i don't like that one i can get rid of that is it a substance that promotes immunocompetence no virulence is a bad thing immunocompetence is a good thing right if i'm immunocompetent it means that what my immune system is competent and it's doing its job. It's intact. If I'm immunocompromised, when you're in a compromising position, that means what? You're in trouble. That's not. It. it refers to the ability of a microorganism to produce disease. Wait a minute. That sounds lot, right? That sounds good, right? No. So I, I can keep that. It sounds good. D, it refers to the frequency at which the pathogen causes the disease. Okay. I've got two things that sound what? Good. I now got it down to my two best things. So, is it the micro? I go, uh, uh, if something's virulent, does it produce disease? Yeah. He goes, but if something's virulent, does it, it goes, does it, uh, are we talking about its frequency or how many? It goes, what are the odds of me getting sick? And the answer is, What's the answer? D. D, right? So let me highlight this and let me highlight the key word. So how are you going to tell pathogen, pathogenicity and virulence apart? Virulence is the frequency at which you can get sick. Pathogenicity just means do you get sick or don't you get sick? And pathogenicity, <laughs> means you get sick. So now that if you got that one wrong, now will that now be in the back of your mind? Like, oh, my opponent, this test, tripped me up in practice. I'm not going to get tripped up in the real exam. So in the real exam, I'm looking for what? Frequency, virulence. I'll even put them in the same color so that, you know, you can associate it. Which of the following pathogens is called a one cell organism? So, as one cell, as no nucleus, but causes a wide range of illness. So, what's the, it goes, is it a bacteria? Yes. Is it a virus? No. Now, do you see what I'm doing? 
even though I have what I think is my answer on letter A, do I still have to go over all the other answers? Yes, because remember, this is a protocol you're trying to learn. Could there be a better answer further down the line? There could. How many times have you chosen the, uh, the answer that was kind of close, but wasn't the best answer? And if you do your multiple choice, you know that a fungus isn't one cell. You're going to think what? Plant. A protozoa. What's the key word for protozoa that we learned? Remember, P, protozoa, parasite. And also, remember the story. Rickets, remember my story. We talked about what? Ticks, lice, helmet. You see a worm with a what? A helmet. So I can now eliminate all of these. And who do I have left? Bacteria. Is a bacteria one cell organism? Yes. Does it have uh, no nucleus? Yes. Does it cause a wide range of diseases? Yes. So do I change it? No, because I believe it suffice for all three parts. Four. Which of the following microorganisms utilizes DNA or RNA? You got to go through the whole thing, right? But who is the one that is so small that it can get all the way inside the nuclear envelope? All these other things, bacteria, fungi, protozoa, helminth, and rickets, they're big things. What's the only thing that's very small? Remember I told you it'll go through skin, it'll go through your mask, it'll go through... Um, uh, the cell wall, and it'll go right into the nucleus. And who is that? So think what? Virus. Very small. Okay? These things are bigger. Virus is tiny. Remember the beach ball to, like, marble or pea analogy? A typical, um, uh, what do you call it? A typical bacteria is, like, the size of a beach ball. But a typical virus is like the size of, you know, like, like a marble or a ball bearing. It's very tiny. Uh, which of the following uh, is a, oops, not call, is a cell. Oh, it's called. Which of the following is called. Oh. A mycosis or mycotic infection and is usually found in an immunocompromised patient. Mycosis means what? Means what? Fungus. Bacteria called a mycosis? No. Uh, can I have uh, bacteria even if I had a, a immunocompromised patient or not immunocompromised? Yeah, you could be perfectly healthy. But who's the one that's known as a mycosis or mycotic infection? It's a fungus, and, and think of fungus like a plant. Which of the following is a single cell parasite that is spread through contaminated? Ugh. You can tell I was going fast. Or through insect bites. Which one uh, was parasite? P, and contaminated food, insect bites. And protozoa? Which of the following is intercellular parasite that spreads disease through fleas, ticks? That's easy. Rickets, rickettsia. Which is the parasitic worm? Think what? I'll even call it a different color. Call it this color. I want you to think worms and helminth. So if my patient, if you notice if my patient is on an anti-helminthic, that means what? They have a worm infection. So how's this? You want to go even a step further? You guys learned white blood cell differential. So my patient who has worms, not only did we have positive tests for worms, I see it. What would their blood test look like? What would be increased in their white blood cell differential? Would it be, uh, how's this? I'll let me even make it easier. Would it be uh, neutrophil, eosinophil, or basophil for uh, a worm or a parasitic infection? Eosinophil. Eosinophil, right? Remember? Think what? Uh, think parasitic infections, and that's exactly what happens. So you can also see that even though we look at things separately, you can put stuff together. 
And that's actually the function of your physician. That's why the, the doctor and the nurse go to school for such a long time. Not necessarily to learn things, but to kind of, you know, put it all together. Uh, what part of the chain of infection is the thing that causes the disease? So do you notice that I wrote A, B, C, D, E, F, G, like in, in a row, in the circle? So look at it like a story, okay? And then, of course, the thing that starts it all has to be the what? Infectious agent. Let's get another one. What part of the chain of infection contains fomites? Meaning, um, uh, oh, remember, it had to sit there, right? Let's say, I put it right there, right? Full, that's a fomite, right? <laughs> I touch this. That's a fomite. Fomite is uh, where goes uh, um, uh, where the infectious agent landed and sat there, and water that sits in a place, you know, to ready to be used is called a reservoir. And fomite, I already answered that. It's an object that carries the uh, that uh, carries the infection. Right? It doesn't cause the infection. Right? Clothes, utensils, your mouse, a keyboard. But I believe you guys are the only ones who use this class. So I get sick of you. Um, it doesn't cause the infection. It doesn't prevent the infection. And we never mention anything about uh, attracting white blood cells through an infection. That's chemotaxis. But what does it do? Think of the story. This is a fomite. This is a fomite. This is a fomite. More phones. Well, we don't have phone phones anymore. Jeez, that's I'm now dating my uh, my lectures. That's how long I've been teaching this topic. Uh, Twenty years. Uh, we used to talk about phones. We actually used to um, do role play on phones. Now that I think about it, it's funny. But actually, at Inova, they not only monitor your phone calls. Uh, well, every corporate structure, they monitor your phone calls, especially if you're in uh, some sort of customer service. Uh, but they also use that for uh, training. And it's really nice, especially um, those of you uh, who are going to be medical systems. Many times your front desk. You know, there's something called the telephone smile. Do you ever call somebody in a place and they're like, yeah, how can I help you? They said the right words, but it sounds what? They're tired. They don't want to deal with you, right? So you always have to have the telephone smile. So good afternoon, Dr. Durandlis' office. How may I help you? Do you see how it's like bland? How's this? This is the telephone smile. I feel like crap. I look like crap. But how am I going to answer the phone? Good afternoon, Dr. Durandlis' office. This is Nelson speaking. How can I help you? You see the intonation? It's very different. Right. Even though a second ago, three patients pissed me off. I'm heated. But what do I do? Even though, sorry to use you as an example, even though she pissed me off, am I going to carry that to the next set of patients? No, I'm a professional. And just like your exam, even though number 11 tripped you up, should you be tripped up for 12? 12 is a different story. It's a different patient. It's a different thing. So that's also another way, another strategy, how you can keep your head in the game. Because um, the mind is a very interesting thing. It can highly motivate you, but it can, uh, I remember somebody in class here, somebody on this side, I believe, somebody said, who's the, what's the, who's the greatest person to do ill to you? And somebody said yourself. And then the next one is, of course, and for me, it's my mother. So, yeah, sans all that. Which of the following modes of transmission deals with touching the door handle that has not been sanitized? Of course, that's what? I had to touch it. What's the key? Touch. Which of the following modes of this with somebody coughing and sneezing without covering their mouth? Droplet. What's the key? Coughing, sneezing. Now, do you see what it's you see the what practice tests do? And and let's say you got it wrong, you retrain yourself, and then what happens come the real test real test. It becomes almost easy. You you actually see the answers coming. Which of the following modes of transmission deals with inhaling small particles? Through the infected heating and ventilation system. So is that close or far? 
The ventilation system of this thing is where? It's on the roof all the way on the other side of the building. It's far away. So you're going to think what? Airborne. So airborne, I want you to think about the HVAC system, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system. I want you to think that you got infected from far away. But droplet, you got infected what? <coughs> two, two, right here. Okay. Ooh, look at this one. Incubation, it goes, what is the period? Oh, yeah, I gave away the answer. What is the period between the, oh, boy, when it, oh, this one first. Deals with mosquitoes, that's the easy, easy what? Mosquitoes, vector. Okay. okay. Now, what is the period between the moment you get infected and the appearance of your mild symptoms? That's, of course, what? Incubation. Because what is the period of time when you first got your symptoms and then the appearance of a full-blown illness, when it got worse? That's your prodromal. Then you have the full-blown illness, and then when do you get better? During convalescence. And remember, what's easier? Learn it like a story. First this happened, then that happened, and then that happened, and then put the labels on it. So it goes incubation, prodromal, illness, and convalescence. I had a student just a couple terms ago. Oh, Dr. Grice, that's IPIC. And I go, what the heck is IPIC? Oh, he went I-P-I-C. Incubation, prodromal, illness, and convalescence. And she goes, oh, it's IPIC. And he goes, when I'm talking about um, uh, the, life, the life cycle of, a, of a clinical disease and your signs and symptoms. Oh, by the way, real quick, just to see how my medical term people are doing. People who have me for medical terminology, what's the difference between a symptom and a sign? Man, I did a 45-minute lecture on that. You guys are killing me. Which one do I see? I see a sign, right? A stop sign. I see it. It's red. It says STOP. That means everyone sees it. That means it's highly objective. It's an object. It's a sign, right? So, for example, a sign is something that you can see. So, if I had a rash, you see it, right? If I had dyspnea, a cough, 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 you hear the wheezing, you see it. But what's a symptom? A symptom is how a patient feels. So right now, well, before, before I took my meds, I was feeling pain and pressure in my right knee. Could you tell? No. Or could I be lying? Sure. So that's highly subjective. That means it's based on the subject. And remember what we said about, sim uh, about, about symptoms? Your patient could, like the littlest thing, like a paper cut, oh my God, it's the worst thing in the world, right? Or it could be the most horrible thing. And the patient could be saying, eh, stuff. It's highly subjective based on the subject. Now, these last two, um, we're going to go over the video. I totally forgot about videos. Um, we're going to go over the videos because the videos are important because they're supplemental. And what, what does that mean? If it got mentioned on the lecture proper and then the author of the lecture gave you a whole bunch of videos, what is it screaming? It's screaming that whatever's on these videos, if it matches the lecture, what are the odds of it coming out on an exam? Pretty good, right? And I can almost tell you, now that I have full control of the exams, it's going to come out. So we're going to look at the uh, supplemental video. So choose the true statement regarding universal precautions. Only blood with a known HIV patient should be treated with care. No, it's all blood. Remember, universal? Not one, just one standard for who? Everybody. I can tell you, back in the 90s, the second they found out you're HIV positive or potentially HIV positive, they treated you like a leper. Like no one wanted to go in the room. Everyone was like, oh, watch out, dude, five is HIV positive. And everyone was like, I even used to watch medical professionals, let's say this is room five, would walk away from the door because they didn't understand what? The anatomy and physiology bill, just like, just like COVID. They didn't understand the anatomy and uh, physiology of it all. You can wear your mask, you wear your PPE, but if you're stressed out all day, complaining about your job, right, taking extra shifts, what's going to happen? You're going to get sick, right? But move, that's what happened to my daughter, nurse, and she quit right in a smack dab in the middle of the pandemic because even though she's all smart, right, went to some high, no, she didn't go to high school, she went to good school, University of Vermont, she couldn't stay in the middle. You can't stay in the middle. What happens? You bow out. I was working in the bank. Lovely. Who's going to pay me my 40 grand? 
That's on tape. Chanel, if you're listening, where's my 40 grand? All right, all kidding aside. So it's not that. Only blood with a known hepatitis patient, which by the way, HIV, on the scale of things, I'd rather have HIV than hepatitis. And if you're exposed to blood, the odds of you getting hepatitis are a lot greater than HIV. And if, uh, well, we haven't had that lecture yet, but when we start talking about next week, we start talking about the GI, your liver performs 12 to 16 vital metabolic functions in your body. There's a reason why it's this big, right? So what happens if I have inflammation or infection of the largest metabolic organ in my body? I'm in a lot of trouble, don't you think? Yep. Only uh, those all bodily fluids should be considered infectious. That's all? One. Only blood should be treated if it was, uh, as, as if it were infected. Only blood? No. We're going to be looking at the uh, video, universal precautions means what? All fluids. All blood. Even if it's not a fluid. You treat it like it's what? Like it's uh, like it's uh, completely infectious. So do you guys notice something with the answers? Did you see even grammatically the answer looked out of place? Only this, only that, only this. And the answer looked a little grammatically out of place. And if you'll also notice, if you're looking at true and false, this is how you know definitely it's a false answer. If the answer is highly restrictive, like only, right? The except, you know, like it, 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 it's very restrictive. So, um, so that's already giving it away. And of course, this is how this is a modified true false state, uh, true false question. So in reality, you have four questions, not one. And how do you do it? Mentally, you would circle true. Okay. Because remember our protocol. I find I first have to define what the question wants. I question only wants true. So what am I going to do? Each one I'm going to ask. Only blood with an HIV patient should be treated with care. Nope. That's what. It's false. Only blood with an hepatitis patient that should be treated with care. Nope. That's also what. False. All body fluids should be considered infectious. All right, okay. I'm, I'm leaning towards true on that one. Only blood should be treated as if it were affected. Only blood or all fluid? So that's what. Maybe a question mark, but I'm leaning more towards false. Now, if you see that, you do your process elimination. What's the one thing that's sticking out? Letter C. Pick letter C. Check against. Is it a true statement? Yep, true statement. Are the other ones false? Yep. So do I change my mind? No, I move on with my day. I'm done. That's why if you have a programmed way to answer questions, multiple choice, and, and I'm telling you, like, uh, you know how they say in like infomercials, it changed my life. I went from mediocre test taker to what? I can ace anything now. And uh, my GMAT scores were proof of it. Uh, I think I had a 93, 90, 92 percentile on my GMAT uh, for my, um, uh, I didn't have to take it because I have an advanced degree, but what did I do? I wanted to get um, some uh, courses off, and I also wanted to get into uh, an advanced placement um, graduate course for finance. So uh, my advisor told me, hey, you know, spend a couple hundred bucks, take the GMAT. You know how long it took me to prep? Three weeks. The, with a job, with an 80 hour per week job. I did it in three weeks. With six kids, I did it in three weeks. With owning two failing businesses, I did it in, it goes in three weeks. Why? Because if you have a programmed way of doing things, all these other distractions in life could become, can, can be put in the background and you can, you can focus. And I used to be one of those people. Uh, what did I get on my SATs? Like super average score, I think. I was, I think I got like 1050, something like that, which back then, super, super average. Um, now, with those scores, if they extrapolate it to the new scoring method, I honestly don't think um, my same college would have let me in. Uh, I, I, I would have had to go someplace else. But now that I learned it and understand it, now it's what? I can pass it on to you. Which of the following government agencies invented 
the Universal Precautions Protocol, right? OSHA, Occupational Safety and Hazard Administration. Now, they are a quasi-government uh, agency, but um, they're what they call a, uh, a compliance regulatory agency. That means they have the power to shut you and your facility down. They shut your facility down, you get a paycheck. I got shut down in OSHA when I was in New York City when I was a medical assistant. And, uh, you know, a medical assistant, you're definitely living paycheck to paycheck. I was so pissed because we were shut down for four days. I lost half my pay. I'm like, ah, so I learned real early. NIH is National Institute of Health or a research body. Uh, Department of Health, right? Which, by the way, you got an OSHA violation? What does OSHA do? It comes to DOH. Guess who visits you now? Yeah. DOH. Uh, one that I didn't mention here is also JCO. It's for hospitals. They call it the Joint Commission, but formerly it's JCAHO, which is the Joint Commission on the Accreditation of Hospital Organizations. They are definitely talking to these guys, talking to these guys. So you get an OSHA violation, guess who's going to go visit you all as well? JCO will visit you early, right? Department of Ed, that's us. FBI, oh, I don't know. Oh, by the way, those of you who are uh, clinical personnel um, uh, and want to get into a government gig, oh, I wish I still had his number. I had a guy, uh, I, um, you guys ever heard of uh, MedTech and Falls Church? Uh, I was a director of education. I had a guy come in from the FBI because I had like a thousand medical assistant students on that, on that campus. And because medical assisting is your stepping stone, usually you're not quite sure if you want to get into nursing or medical billing and coding or healthcare admin. You take medical assisting just like I did to kind of navigate and figure out your way out. What are you going to do, you know, when you uh, step up? Well, other things that you can consider is, do you think you can work for a government agency? Government agencies don't pay a lot, but they are awesome at benefits. And um, it's like the gift that keeps on coming. I worked for a year and a half for um, uh, a government agency, and um, I'm still reaping the benefits of my quote unquote little pension. My mother worked for a government hospital for 24 years and then worked another 10 years in uh, prisons. So what is her, um, uh, what does her pension look like? Actually, she should have stopped working uh, when she was in uh, her 60s. But if you're in healthcare, can you work forever or as long as you want? Yeah. My mom worked, uh, what's she, 84 now? Yeah, she, she really, really stopped 79, right? And because uh, you, know that, uh, you know that adage, like if it's something that you really love doing, then it's not work. This is not work to me. This is fun time. Right? Even, I know I don't get paid a lot, but I get paid to do what? The yap. And it, it's fun. And of course, NSA, another uh, government agency, national security agency. Oh, by the way, these people, FBI, NSA, don't you think they have their own dental clinics? They have their own medical clinics. They don't pay as much as the private sector, but guess what? Well, you have that job for life. I always tell this story. I had a friend of mine when I was working in that government hospital he had a pension for sleeping with his patients and any other place he'd be canned and what you know what they kept on doing to him that whole entire year they kept on moving him around and then i saw him in another hospital another government hospital i'm like jay what are you doing man they didn't take your license yet he goes, nope and he, and he was like and he goes i'm gonna be a dad soon and i'm like oh that's gross why and he goes no, I'm going to do right by her. Uh, then I found out later, not the only kitty in pregnant. Not the only nurse in pregnant. Oh, and he was an equal opportunity uh, sperm spreader. Uh, tax everybody, right? Highly unethical. But in a government agency, he got to do what? Well. He was valued. He didn't want to leave. Therefore, what? They just kept on moving him around. He's in radiology now. I don't know where. Uh, but just because you got an MD, don't mean don't mean you're the most ethical person in the world. And I can tell you right now, um, you know where I met the best cheaters? I met them in medical school. And that's isn't that scary that somebody who's in charge of your healthcare 
uh, is okay cheating in school. That's really scary. But I told you guys the Bimbi story. It'll catch up to you, and uh, you'll be prosecuted with the maximum maximum extent of the law. And you'll not only be fired, it is the civil suit that will come after you, the wrongful death suit that will come after you. That Oh, by the way, wrongful death also has no cap. Wrongful death now also attacks techs and nurses. Right? So they'll never attack the medical systems because they know we're always broke. But, you know, if you have, if you have a history of uh, doing bad stuff, it will follow you. So let me be good on my promise to look at some of these videos. And um, also, just as, uh, just as, as another form of, hey, this is uh, something, you know, uh, just look at it because there are also sources of what your professor can do. And, uh oh. I'm living in the past. Unit two, please. So we did this, the phatic immune system, immune system, but there's a nice set of videos down here. Also here as well. Let's do it. We've had a lot of time. Let's look at this one first. All right, well, what I'm doing is I'm taking notes as if I'm a student. Went by pretty quick, and it was pretty boring looking. And uh, at least if they showed a beast, they could have showed some pretty people, but they didn't. So in that small little section, what can you get out of it? Now, just by looking at how I did it, right? Constant body versus microbes. OK, so now we know that even when I'm well, the immune system is also still working. And doesn't this look familiar? The lines of defense, external, internal, 
and uh, immune system. And the immune system was what? Specific or, we'll talk about that in a minute, adaptive. So we look at external. Your skin and the hard protein that they're talking about is keratin, which by the way, how many of you spend hundreds of dollars on those, uh, those, uh, like those uh, products? Oh, my wife, even though she has you know, a lot of education in science, she still spends hundreds of dollars, you know? It's got keratin and collagen in it. That's why it makes my skin and my hair so silky smooth. And I go, if I want vitamin A, do I smear it all over my face? No, I have to eat it, my body processes it, and then it makes it for me. That's where you get keratin from. And then of course, you take care of your skin, should you, should you be outside all day, right? So that's why every time my wife goes, oh, look at this Lancome. It was on sale, $950. And I'll be like, and so for what? And they go, well, it's made out of real baby seal milk. And you're like, and I'm like, did you have a degree? And then she's like, shut up. And then we get into arguments and then I lose. That's pretty much the whole life cycle of my marriage. So external, hard protein. Everything on the outside of your skin has to be what? Tough. And again, my argument against elective surgery. If I'm cutting into you, it's going to cause problems. And that keratin, right? Keratin, think what? On the outside. Collagen's on the inside. And you get this stuff through your diet. And sweat and sebaceous glands. We already talked about that. When you sweat, right? Hey, have you ever... Um, have you ever worked out really bad and you sweat and it got in your eye and it burned it? Huh? I'm the only one, right? Well, I don't work out like that anymore, but before I used to work in my youth, I used to work out um, a lot harder and sometimes it would burn my eyes because what does sweat and the oil, that's your sebaceous glands, they have inhibitory functions because if this is all, water is always coming out, right? And this is all oily, can anything go in? So that's why skin, even though it's ignored, I remember even in medical school, we kind of made fun of the Department of Dermatology. And then they made fun of us back because at around 4.30, 5 o'clock, they get to go home. And the rest of us, well, I'd be there like in internal medicine looking at all the dermatologists like 5, five 6 o'clock. And I'm just starting uh, evening rotation rounds. I look at them, I used to get so angry. But it's very important because it is the... Line of defense, it is the external, front line, first line, innate. Then we have the mucous membranes. Now, they mentioned the word enzymes. I gave a little bit uh, to my uh, med, med term. Anyone know what an enzyme is? You guys are killing me. You guys make me question my, my teaching abilities. Enzyme. Remember we talked about uh, in medical terminology uh, about hamburger? How long does it take for the hamburger to break down if I lift it, left it in the parking lot? It would take ages, wouldn't it? Especially if it's McDonald's. If it's McDonald's, it, it will be that burger long after you graduate, <laughs> right? Oh, there's people around the world who keep the fries. Oh, I was cleaning out the car and of course I had kids, I got fries. My kids were eating the fries and he goes, Papa, he goes, this one's still warm. And I'm like, and I'm like, ew, please don't do that. And they're just, the fortune will go, no, it's still good. And I'm like, and I go, do you remember the last time? It was pre-pandemic when we ate fries in here. And, go, and, and she was like, well, it's warm and it tastes good. And then I was questioning, why is it in 20 degree weather, why is the fry still warm? Because enzymes are proteins that break things down. Why do you think uh, whoever raised you taught you to do what? Remember what they say when you when you eat food? You got to chew what? 20 times? Because saliva has enzymes that will break down the food, right? And of course, mucus, it's sticky, it traps it, and then it releases when you cough and sneeze. We already learned that from this lecture. You saw cough and sneeze, you saw mucus more than once. So is that droplet infection going to come out for this exam? You darn toot me with it. It would be criminal if I didn't put that on the exam. And of course, enzymes. We're gonna learn next week that your stomach is full of acid. I mean, acid, acid, like the acid in the movies. If I took the pH one acid from my stomach and I put it on the hood of your car, 
it's going to eat through the metal. But then you say to yourself, why in heaven's name, whoever built us, put that inside me. What am I, alien? Remember the alien? Uh, I'm the only one who watched the sci-fi channel. You know the one? You got the mouth and the mouth, right? And then, uh, oh, no, that's a different alien. Well, Sigourney Weaver, remember? Right? An alien? Because I keep on forgetting that, uh, that I watch way too much garbage. But enzyme, uh, those enzymes and acids, when you swallow, remember, this is the dirtiest thing in the world. And all your food, you can nuke it 20 times over, it's still nasty. Like I said, take any of your vegetables, soak it in water, in cold water, just leave it there for 15 minutes. Take out the vegetables, look what you see there. And that's just soaking. I'm not scrubbing my vegetables, I'm doing anything. That's going inside you. So there has to be enzymes. These, um, uh, an enzyme, you'll know, it has A-S-E in the end. So if you have a proteinase, it's an enzyme that breaks down proteins. If you have a lipase, it's an enzyme that breaks down lipids. So that's what an enzyme is. And this is all internal. And if I have an acidic environment that burns all the bacteria, then that bad street taco, in theory, should be what? Do you guys ever notice if you eat like bad food, like, um, like, uh, and street food is like the best, but you know it's kind of questionable if they have a license or not. But that's what makes it taste so great, isn't it? So you eat that, do you notice you get heartburn? Right, because why? There's a lot of salt, there's a lot of fat, and there's a lot of bacteria, and then when there's a lot of bacteria, you got a lot of acid. And sometimes that acid kicks up and you get a little bit of GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Warm, moist, and it's, it's warm, it's moist. So mucus, if it were normal levels, we're okay. If you have too much mucus, how much trouble you in? If you have bronchitis, if you have asthma, you're going to have too much mucus and then it becomes problematic. We talked about thugs. They mentioned what? The phagocytic natural killer cell. We also mentioned T cytotoxic cell. We also mentioned monocytes that turn into macrophages. They all do what? They eat things. They walk around, and when the T cell, T helper cell says, that's a bad guy, these things, phagocytosis, and of course, we already learned fever. Low grade fever, do I give Tylenol? 99 degrees? No. Nope. But when it starts going 100, 101, then I give an antipyretic, which is Tylenol. If it goes too high, what, what's going to happen to me? I could do what? I first get a seizure, and then I go into a coma, right? And then you can snap out of it. And I can tell you, it's horrible. Um, um, you name the infection, I probably got it. But uh, I had a 105, 106 uh, degree fever. And it was so bad, I can even feel, it feels like my body was going to snap into two. And I remember feeling the, sur I feeling the seizure come. I was like, I start feeling really crampy. I'm like, oh, -oh. and then next thing you know, nurse is holding me down. I'm like, oh, -oh. I can't control anything. And then, of course, you can remember it because a seizure is uncoordinated brain function. So when your person wakes up, do they remember anything? No, you have a little bit of retrograde amnesia. But I definitely remember coming on. I'm like, oh, oh, something's weird, something's weird. And then the next thing I know, I woke up, nurse was like, okay, you had a seizure. We got your fever down. It's now 103. And I was doing the classic, like, mom, is it time to go to school yet? I was, um, I remember my cousin was really, he goes, you were saying the funniest things. And I'm like, it's good that you can laugh while I'm dying. Very, very fun of you. And he goes, no, it was really funny. It was really entertaining. And he says, you're not going to die. And he goes, not that way. And I'm like, thanks. Now, do you see how this is all what? Non-specific. And this, your immune system that we talked about with the antibodies and T cells and B cells are what? Specific. So if something's specific, it has to adapt. Right? If something is general, it doesn't adapt. It just exists like your mucus right your mucus is there whether you like it or not your skin is there whether you like it or not but your immune system when you start getting attacking what happens lymph nodes get lymph fluids start getting up inflammation process gets going so you could see by watching this video 
it's already now doing what? It's not only supplementing the thing that you learned in lecture today, right? It'll now do what? It gives you now a hint on what's important. What does the author of this class, right, think that's important? And would I be wasting my time talking about it if it wasn't important? And also, it's yet another way for you to learn how to do this active listening. Now, I just wish there was a way there was a, a split screen to show you how I did it. But essentially, you're on listening mode. And anything interesting, you just write it, right? And if it falls underneath um, a category, I just tab in and it'll create the dots. And how do you create these bullets? You, you know, up here you do the bullet points. So like every new thing, I just go down one step and then tab, uh, and, and, and then you could see how things kind of fall into place. This is also a neat way to uh, figure out if you're uh, the person up front has actually prepared. Have you ever had a professor, and I've had thousands of them, who it's obvious that you're just talking, that there's no rhyme or reason, and you're going to get that, especially in graduate school. They just talk about whatever interests them, right? But if you look at someone's presentation, if you break it down, you'll see a pattern of what's important. And remember, because your continuing medical education most likely will be a multiple choice examination at every training. If you do not pass it, you must not only repeat it, you have to pay for it, okay? So that will be more impetus and more uh, motivation for you to learn this skill set, which um, oh, I forgot who coined that phrase, active listening. I, I think it was in one of, my, um, one of my English classes where I learned that. And so those of you who are, have to take it like, or, or, or take your English class or whatever, like let's say you just missed your score by this much and now you have to take an English class. Take advantage of it. Uh, and take it apart and grab the pearls that you need because they're skill sets that are really important. Oh, how about this? HIV, uh, you help them. Now, for education purposes, uh, uh, they, made the, um, they made this virus uh, very, very big. But in reality, it's probably the size of this dot in the word biology. Now, did you see how easy it just went in? That it just melted right in. And that's exactly what happens when, uh, when HIV is very small. Now, here's the other problem with viruses. Do you see that um, every cell has these little glycoproteins on it? So these glycoproteins, remember the antigen, says that what? This gray cell here, good guy. The little red cells here, this HIV, they're, do you see those spikes? That means bad guy. The problem is if they're very, very small, they're not detectable, and do you see what happened in the video? Oh. And then they take over the cell, they take over the DNA and RNA, and instead of the DNA and RNA will typically tell the cell, hey, business as usual, if you're a heart cell, make some more heart cells, let's beat. If you're a muscle cell, make some more muscle cells, let's go contract. But instead, they took over the DNA and RNA, then they ate everything in the house, and then what happens? When they all come out, and again, for educational purposes, they made it really big. In reality, there'd be 10,000 viruses from a single cell and then multiple cells got affected in the thousands. So you'll have this virus that's very small in the millions, and that's called viral load. And it's hard to defend against that, right? If I throw, if I threw one ball at you, right? You take your tennis racket, you're able to defend yourself, right? What if I threw a thousand of them at you? Would you be able to stop any of them? No, the majority of them will get right past you, and especially if they're very small. So now you can see this. Now you can see how 
HIV is really, really messed up. No, there's known reasons. Again, like I stated, I have antibodies. They're highly specific. But like I said, if I have a, if I have a, a, a severe viral load, I throw one tennis ball at you. You can defend yourself. But if I threw a thousand at them, all of them are going to get by you. You won't be able to stop it. So even though it has antibodies, right, this thing happens way too fast. And remember, my antibodies where is on the outside. Where's all the horribleness? That's a word. Where's all that happening on the inside? So once that thing explodes, the antibodies are overwhelmed. It's too late. So, like I said, like once you get HIV, there's not much I could do to you. You got HIV, your eventual path is what AIDS. But we learned over the years that I can postpone that, and I could get the viral load down. What? to very small uh, amounts. And that's why my cousin, uh, 10 years ago, was uh, diagnosed with HIV. He's healthier than I am because there's rules, there's protocols, and there's medication to do what? Get his viral load down, and he lives a very fruitful life. Oh, here's also the other messed up part. Remember, we recognize good guys and bad guys because of their coat. Well, 25 years ago, we had HIV-1, had uh, glycoprotein 120 on it, GP-120, AIDS, right? Then we discovered, wait, a whole bunch of people had GP-95, glycoprotein 95. Oopsies, there's another virus. So it's all because, so even if I built up defenses on one, I have another one that can attack me where? In the same fashion, but they have a different jacket. And that's why uh, uh, immune system is all about recognition. And that's why, oh, when this paper came out, when they talked about GP95, uh, I, I, pretty much, I pretty much threw my lab coat on the floor and I said, all right, we're all done. But then you go, well, we have, we have other ways. Retrovirus, now what does that mean? So they came from the host. Look at this, and he's talking about these HIVs. Now, those of you who had me for uh, for medical terminology, remember the pathway? It went like this. Let's say this is the nucleus, right? And then we're headed towards the back of the room, which is the ribosome that makes protein. So the DNA gets copied, photocopier, right? And then you transcribe it. So uh, uh, mRNA, messenger RNA, transcribed is great. They write the code from the copy. Then mRNA goes outside the cell, the tRNA, transfer RNA, then it talks to the ribosome, translates, then says, hey, ribosome, make me this protein so I can make more normal cells. Good, right? It goes from DNA, mRNA, tRNA, ribosome. Wonderful. This is how nasty HIV is. HIV comes in, it comes in, and it hijacks the RNA. And go, hold up. Remember the mRNA that's making making the, the, the transcription so you can give it to the ribosome? He goes, mm -hmm, no, mm -hmm. we're not doing that now. We're doing this now. 
make more HIV friends. So it does what? It goes backwards and then sends a new message forward. How can you, how can you defeat that? How in heaven's sake can you defeat that? Well, there's ways. But that's extra nasty, isn't it? That's why they call it a retrovirus, because it's going backwards. It's going up the production line instead of what? From DNA to mRNA to tRNA, it's doing what? It's going up this way and then rewriting history and then rewriting all the instructions to go back out. That is ultra nasty, right? And a lot of viruses do that. So then when someone asks you, oh, you science people aren't so, so smart. Why don't we cure the common cold? Why can't we go cure COVID? Why couldn't we do any of this? Now you know why, because that virus is extra nasty. And it's, it's a way more complicated than what? Me sneezing on you, because most lay persons think that what? I sneeze on you, I find it, I give you a pill, the pill makes it go away magically. It's not like that. It, you can see how way more complex it is. And now you can, well, if you're a chemist like me, you can appreciate the nastiness of it all, but it, to me, when I still look at it, it's kind of scary. Because now there's no more instructions to say, hey, you're going to be a helper T cell. All the instructions now are what? Hey, make more HIV. How can you stop that? But now we learned that what, remember we told you about the new latest uh, drugs, monoclonal antibodies. Monoclonal antibodies do the same thing that the virus do. They go inside, they're a protein, they're highly specific, and then they go tell the DNA to do other things. Like for hay fever stuff, like um, hay fever stuff, a monoclonal antibody can tell the DNA of your immune system, hey, stop reacting, you're overreacting. Suppress it without any corticosteroid reactions. Isn't that neat? But there's other reactions like, you know, bleeding out of your nose, bleeding out of your butt, and maybe blindness. And I love when they say possible death. You ever hear that on commercials? It's all happy and goes, you could be bleeding from your eyeballs, bleeding out of your ears, or possible death. And you could almost never take any medication with uh, mal inhibitors, and you're going to learn what those are. So just looking at um, looking at these videos, they only take a couple of minutes, but did you see now you have more you have more fuel to remember stuff? And also, remember when I told you, does the doctor or DNP have time to talk to your patient? No, they do not. Who needs to make the time? You, the tech, you, the medical assistant. I go, uh, or, and our future nurse. You need to make that time, not me. Everyone says, doctors should have a better bedside manner. No. Doctors should have a better diag uh, um, uh, diagnostic uh, set of skills. I don't need to be, I do not need to be a people person. But you need to be that pe a people person. And one of those ways is knowing this stuff, not only for some silly exam, which by the way, you notice I keep on asking questions from a term or two ago and none of y'all can answer them or you're too hot, shy to answer them, right? It's not because you're stupid. It's not because you have a horrible memory, but what did you do at the time? I want to survive. Let me get my A and move on with my day. Change up that mentality because you're going to be restudying stuff. And I'm looking at my seniors and my nurses down the hall every day like, Dr. Guys, because I don't remember lecturing this. And I go, no, you don't. And he goes, I could tell, and it was only what? How many terms ago? Six terms ago, um, six, seven terms. And my seniors now, they're on their way out. They can't, now they have to do daily um, case studies where they have to make sense of their diagnosis. Where did the diagnosis come from? So you have to know your normal anatomy and physiology. They're like, oh, they always say the same thing. You told us not to forget that. And I go, yeah, I told you not to forget it. But now what happened? I forgot it. Okay. Now my nurse proctor is yelling at me. Okay. There's going to be more of that. You don't figure it out. Now, this video here is really interesting because remember we talked about chemotaxis? Remember the Purell? That bad pathogenic bacteria? 
and I'm in my artery here. I'm a white blood cell, so I'm going to perform diapedesis, dia, complete or thorough, peds. I'm going to walk out of that artery, and I'm going to go straight head for the pathogen. How do I know that pathogen? Chemotaxis. Now, what are those chemicals that are attracting me to the trouble? And one of those, we already know about immunoglobulins, right? Immunoglobulin A, B, and we know that's going to come out. Well, this stuff could come out. Let's talk about complement. Kudos to whoever made this video. Now, remember the antibodies? Right? Antibodies recognize the surface. Remember the, the Y part of the antibody? Remember the antibody is the thing that's going to do the damage, right? The coating, this green, that's the antigen. So the antibody recognizes the antigen and then sticks, sticks on the Y part, remember? The variable region. Now, the, all this stuff, uh, you know what it is, but uh, when, when they explain it, now, what happens? You have these chemicals called complement. C1, C3, C5, yada, 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 yada. But they form something what they call a cascade. And what's a cascade? You all been to weddings, right? You put up the champagne, right, in a pyramid. Right? Oh, ever see one fall? Happens like every fifth or sixth wedding. I've been doing weddings for like 25 years, and I always love uh, watching um, wedding drama. That's why they pay me so much. Well, so little. Now, they pour the champagne at the top. The top level then goes to this level, then activates the next level, then activates the next level, then activates the next level. Isn't that what you're seeing? That's actually what happens with all those enzymes that we talked about when you eat food. This is also what happens when this, the green is the pathogen. Your antibodies recognize this. Oh, that's that green dude that was here before. We're gonna burn that guy. So the, it goes in there and then, remember the chemotaxis? It attracts a whole bunch of chemicals. And all those chemicals, we already now know some of them as immunoglobulins. Another set is called complement. Something called complement, you know when something complements to you or complement, you know, uh, when things complement each other, you know, like uh, peaches and cream and, uh, I don't know, what's another? You know, things that, uh, you know what I'm saying, things that go together, like ketchup and fries, right? I'm, uh, yes, I'm hungry, <laughs> right? So complement gets activated when the antibodies get activated, and then a whole cascade of things happen. And one of them they mentioned was what? Inflammation. Inflammation is what? Nonspecific. So we had to activate the nonspecific thing first. Then after that, C3, C5A, and all these other ones then activated something highly specific in your um, uh, independent review. Didn't, wasn't there a question that wasn't on the lecture? It was called perforins, right? What, what was the answer to perforin? Something that perforates something is what? A protein that does what? Drills a hole. And did you see what it did here? So you have inflammation which will do what? Gummify everything. No, no bad guys can get out, no bad guys can get in. Smart, huh? Forms a nice perimeter. Then we have what? More specific proteins that come in here, C3, C5A, and you see how it starts to penetrate? Those are your perforins. They're perforating. It's, ac it's actually how penicillin works, makes holes in the pathogenic bacteria. 
right? And then what happens? We make even bigger holes. Again, another set of proteins, and then it forms it, and then it sits right in there, and then, poof. Now, remember we talked about diffusion high versus low? The reason why all, did you guys ever wonder why when you jump in a swimming pool or jump in a hot tub, you don't fall apart? Because what? All the bonds are keeping you together. And the pressures on the inside equal the pressures on the outside of cells. Now, what happens if I drill a hole? Right? Just like drilling a hole in your lung. If there's no gradient of high and low, what's going to happen? It's just going to deflate. And that's exactly what happens to the cell. So when you see complement, you're going to think of what? Immunoglobulins, you're going to think chemotaxis, you're going to think the cascading. And the first thing is what? Antibody recognition. Second thing, inflammation. Third thing, perforins, drill a hole. So now you can see the author put in this video specifically. The author, now it answers your question. Why wasn't this thing on, why wasn't this thing on the, um, uh, on the lecture? Because it was in a supplemental video and your, whoever was the author of this wanted you to not only look at his lecture, wanted to also look at the videos as well. So doesn't that answer the question? Should I be looking at these videos or not? Yeah, but what is the primary source is always where? Uh, the, um, what do you call it? Uh, the lecture itself.